All right, so we, we finished up the hyperlipidemia stuff. Then we got into, and again, what's the gold standard for hyperlipidemia management? Statins. statins, right? Just go with the statins if you're if you're ever confused. If you have something uh, like a patient with hypertriglyceridemia, and that's our only issue, what could you use? Fibrate. Fibrate's good. What else? Niacin. Niacin's good, right? If you want to get their HDL up. Niacin. Niacin. Vibrates, right? Those are also good to do that too, right? So again, they, those kind of fit the same kind of niche there. Um, right, so again, remember things like, you know, who should be getting high intensity statins, who maybe should be getting moderate intensity statins. Those are things to kind of look at, you know. If I have a really old patient with a really high cardiovascular risk, maybe they can't tolerate a high intensity statin. Maybe we gotta bump it down a little bit, right? Little things to think about. Um, we started going through the diuretics, right? So again, we got through the major classes of diuretics. We'll finish that up right here and then move into some of our other classes of drugs, right? So we talk about loop diuretics. Loops work where? The loop of Hanley, easy enough, right? The thiazides work where? Distal convoluted tubule. Distal convoluted Good. The, what do we do? Um, uh, aldosterone antagonists, where do those work? Collecting, Collecting duct. duct. Good. We had the uh, potassium sparing direct. You know, aldosterone antagonists kind of fit into the potassium sparing, but remember the other two we had, we had triamterine and amylaride. Those are, again, working in the, the, the collecting duct mainly, right? So, again, remember the different actions. Like, which one's going to raise your potassium? Yeah. Well, looking at the specifically the diuretics. Potassium sparing, right? So amylaride, triamterene, and your aldosterone antagonist, right? Which ones fit into that category? Spironolactone? Yeah, pluralinone, right? Again, everything else is going to cause hypokalemia, right? That's important because when you're combining diuretics, look at their electrolytes, right? Because again, when we get into antiarrhythmics, we're going to see electrolytes are very important for that. If you get someone's potassium too high, too low, you're going to send them into an arrhythmia. You've got to be really careful of those patients, right? These are things you want to start to consider. Okay. So again, the last group of here we're going to talk about is carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. We already covered drugs like this before. Anyone remember where we covered it? Uh, Ophthalmology, right? What do we use that for? Glaucoma. Glaucoma, perfect. So what do these do? They decrease intraocular pressure by doing what? Decrease production of aqueous humor, right? How, do the, how does that work? Perfect. Yeah, carbonic anhydrase is going to both uh, catalyze conversion of CO2 and water into bicarbonate and then also convert bicarbonate back into CO2 and water, right? Because again, typically you're going to find bicarb when it has a negative charge on it. I'm sorry, positive charge on it. It doesn't want to cross over. I'm sorry, negative charge, I should say. It doesn't want to cross over those membranes very easily. CO2 and water, though, very easy to cross over, right? So that's what's going to help um, to, to change the flow of water, right? And that's why it's important for the eye because it decreases aqueous humor production. It's also going to work here in the kidneys kind of similarly to kind of control that water flow, right? And again, if I have more water out in the in the renal tubules, what am I going to get? More, so I have more fluid in the renal tubules, more of it's going to get shuttled through, and guess what? It's going to come out as urine, right? So again, that's when, how we're going to see this diuretic effect here. Now, these are very wimpy as far as diuretics go because, again, they're working in the proximal convoluted tubule. Again, that's where you normally see a lot of bicarb uh, reabsorption occur. But again, think about it. It has the rest of the whole renal tubule to go through. It has to go through the loop, the distal convoluted tubule, the collecting duct. So there's a lot of places for the kidney to sort of uh, compensate for that diuretic effect. So again, not used commonly as sort of like a first-line diuretic because it's pretty wimpy overall. However, there are some uh, unique things we'll actually use it for, some unique indications we'll see in a little bit. But it's important to know some of the, the electrolyte changes you're going to see when you have one of these carbonic anhydrase inhibitors on board. Okay, So again, you're going to see kind of short-term effects that you'll get some increase in sodium and potassium uh, excretion here, but long-term you're going to find it's pretty well reduced. So again, very minimal diuretic effects in the long-term, not very good for a hypertensive medication or antihypertensive medication. Right? What do we say is like pretty good out of the, the diuretics for hypertension? Thiazides are going to be the best one uh, out of that, right? Loops are very good for getting rid of fluid, not great for long-term control of blood pressure. Thiazides are okay? So the main agent you're going to see for this is going to be acetazolamide or diamox, okay? You can kind of see, and again, don't get too, uh, just think that this is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It's preventing reabsorption of bicarbon water, right? That bicarbon water is going to stay out in the renal tubule. Is it going to get flushed out? So what do you think that does to the systematic pH of the body? It gets more acidic, right? Because I'm losing my bicarbs, so I can cause a metabolic acidosis, right? So this is actually one way you can see it's causing a metabolic acidosis, which may be okay. That's actually one of the therapeutic reasons why we use this for uh, a disease state. We'll talk about it in just a second here, right? But basically, normally you'd have carbonic anhydrase splitting up that bicarb, so that way you can actually reabsorb it. If you inhibit that, all of it stays out here, and then it's going to draw along a little bit of salt, a little bit of uh, potassium along with that, and it causes a mild diuresis, okay? But again, also you're losing bicarb along with that. What do we say normally occurs? What happens normally with the pH when you have something like a loop diuretic on board? 
you get a little bit of an alkalosis called that contraction alkalosis because basically you're kind of uh, concentrating the stuff in the blood and that includes the bicarb there. So again, this is the opposite. You're actually with a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor, you see a little bit of an acidosis. So again, one of the things that kind of sets it apart, right? Um, big thing we use it for is glaucoma, as you know, so brinzolamide, dorzolamide, those are the big things there. Um, in some cases, we use this for epilepsy. What you find is if you cause the body to be a little bit more acidic, you can actually increase the seizure threshold. Try saying seizure threshold five times fast. We'll get you. It's very tongue twisty. But um, by getting yourself a little bit more acidotic, you increase that threshold, meaning it's harder to have a seizure. And so sometimes we'll do that with patients with refractory epilepsy. That's also why we do what we call a ketogenic diet for those patients. Anyone ever heard of a ketogenic diet? A lot of people do keto diets nowadays. What does that do? Or how do you get into a ketogenic diet? Eating no carbs. Yeah, lo no carbs, right? So again, you get very low carbohydrate intake. Your body switches over to oxidizing fatty acids. That produces acids, right? Ketones, right? So again, that's why you end up seeing a little bit of acidosis with that. Again, similar reason why you may see patients with epilepsy, difficult to treat epilepsy on a ketogenic diet, right? We'll talk more about that in the neurology later on. But uh, the other thing we'll see is with mountain sickness, right? So again, when you go, what's the problem when you go from, say, sea level here, or say below sea level, so we live in a swamp, going up to, say, Colorado, mile high? Less oxygen, right? The partial pressure of oxygen goes down as you increase the altitude there. So what is that, why, why is that problem? I'll never forget, I went to, and again, I'm not like the worst shaped guy in the whole wide world, but you know, I can walk up a set of stairs usually without getting totally winded. One time I went to Colorado and I went to walk up a set of stairs. I thought I was going to die. It was the absolute <laughs> worst. I was just huffing and puffing. I go, this is, place is terrible. What is, what is up with it? But that was because my body was not used to having that low amount of oxygen compared to being down here at sea level. So one of the things you'll find this is actually kind of interesting with a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. We said it makes you more alkalotic, acidotic. Acidotic, what does the acidosis do to your respiratory drive? Stimulates it, right? So it's almost like you have too much CO2 around, so it wants to breathe that off. So if I'm hyperventilating, what am I bringing more in? More oxygen, right? So that's one of those ways we can try to increase the oxygen concentration in the blood and hopefully deliver more to the system. And so, again, that's one way we can actually use that for altitude sickness, right? Usually it's good if you take it a little bit beforehand and then uh, before you go to, you know, on your trip, and then that can actually help to um, mitigate some of that effects there, right? I did not take that, which is why I was huffing and puffing so bad, okay? Um, Anyway, other things you might see this for is if you have a patient with like a head injury. So if you work like in a trauma center or surgical ICU, someone gets a uh, head injury, typically you swell. You can actually give this to decrease the amount of uh, uh, CSF fluid you're actually producing or cerebral spinal fluid you're producing there. So that's one thing you may also see that use for as well. Okay, so lots of different uses for it. So mountain sickness, yeah. it's kind of big because the body, it, it makes the body more acidic. Mm -hmm. that it, and then you have to end up like hyperventilating to... Yeah, remember your body's um, drive, your respiratory drive is much more sensitive to hypercapnia, or hypercarbia, I should say, uh, than it is to hypoxia. So you respond more strongly to CO2 levels rising than you do to O2 levels going down. I'll give you a good example of this. I worked with, um, when I was doing, during my fellowship, we worked in an ER, and there's an ER residency going on there. And sometimes in the middle of the night, they get a little bored. And so they played a game called DSAT. Basically, they'd all hook themselves up to, you know, have you played this game? No. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that already sounds hilarious, right? So basically, they would hook themselves up to a pulse ox, and they would hold their breath to see how low they could get their pulse ox down before they had to take a breath. Wow. It was very, very difficult to get below 100% because of the reason. It wasn't because their O2 levels are going down. That was evident by the pulse ox. It's because their CO2 levels were, were building up. So that is a much stronger impulse to breathe than your O2 levels going down. So by doing that, you're creating a hyper, uh, this acidosis, you have too much CO2 around, so you're sending uh, signals to your brain to say, we need to breathe this off. And so that hyperventilation helps to bring in more oxygen, right? So that's how it kind of works, right? And that's only for a couple of days that's going to be uh, working because then eventually your body's going to start to generate more hemoglobin and that carries, you know, that's why people, you know, athletes will go train in high altitudes because they can kind of blood dope themselves, so to speak, to build up hemoglobin concentrations. It's more of a mild hyperventilation. So again, you may be, uh, you know, not just uh, tachypnea, but you may be having a uh, hyperpnea, right? So you're kind of breathing deeper and trying to blow off that CO2. Um, so again, it kind of, again, it's not like the thing is going to completely correct it, but it kind of helps with the headaches and stuff like that you're going to get from being mildly hypoxic, right? You know, it may not be helping me when I'm trying to climb up the set of stairs, but again, just that baseline from my rest, hopefully it's going to help increase the, uh, the O2 concentration so I don't get a headache, right? That's kind of the thing you see with that. Okay, yeah, make sense? You know, try to bring in multiple kind of outside references to try to drive some of those points home there, uh, if that makes some, some sense.
Anyway, I mentioned metablock acidosis, as I already talked about. You know, uh, in some cases, you may see a little bit of drowsiness associated with it, not something you see with a lot of other diuretics. Uh, and then again, potassium depletion. Hypokalemia will come uh, from this as well, just like other diuretics. There's a couple of osmotic diuretics you may run into as well. When you, when you think of osmotic diuretics, right, how do you think those work? Yeah, they're going to have a high osmolarity. They're going to get completely filtered through the glomerulus, and that's going to draw water to it, right? So again, by having a very hyperosmolar solution within the renal tubules, that draws water along with it. Try to dilute it out, and then you end up peeing it out. So there's a couple of osmotic diuretics you're going to see here. They don't get used frequently as a diuretic. However, there are a couple of cases here where you can actually draw fluid off of other places as well, which I'll show you in just a minute. Big one you're going to run into is called mannitol. Um, this is used a lot of times in cases where you have, um, yeah, so increased intracerebral pressure, right? So if your ICPs are high, and again, that's intracerebral pressure, not insane clown posse, right? Um, you're going to find, <laughs> hopefully no one here actually knows that music, but um, you're going to find that when you have that buildup of fluid on the brain, you want to get it off. And so I can do the same thing. Just like in the renal tubules, I can pull fluid off by having that hyperosmolar solution in the renal tubules. I can do the same thing in the bloodstream. So I'll give a dose of mannitol. That will actually draw that fluid off of the brain, off of the CNS, right, through the blood-brain barrier. And that can decrease that pressure there, which can be very important. Because, again, high pressure in your in the ICP, what's that going to do? Where's it go? Where's the brain going to go? Because, again, the skull is not compressible. Right? You can't expand out your skull, right? Some people's heads get a little bit bigger you know, from time to time. But normally that skull's not going to let that brain to go anywhere. It's going to go right out the brainstem, right? So again, that's, you don't want to have a herniation uh, of your brainstem, okay? That is usually fatal. So don't want to do that. So this is a drug we'll use in that in like trauma cases or, you know, like, um, you know, other cases you may have, uh, you know, sometimes we'll have like really severe diabetic ketoacidosis that can develop increased intracranial pressure. There's, there's different reasons why you may develop that, but this is a drug we'll use sometimes. Okay. Again, sometimes for acute renal failure, not, not frequently, um, but again, as I mentioned, sometimes in acute glaucoma, pressures are really high. You can draw some fluid off of there and, and get down intraocular pressures. And I mentioned the cerebral edema and swelling. Okay, so that's it for the diuretics. Now let's get into kind of your mainstay, sort of like really good go-to hypertensive uh, sort of medications here. This is the RAS inhibitors, and RAS stands for? Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Good. Have you covered these already? Fantastic. My work is done for me. We'll just skip over this part, right? No. Okay. So what does the renal angiotensin system do for us? Regulates blood pressure, typically doing what to it? Increase it. How does it do that? Increases sodium reuptake, right? So again, we're going to find that we're going to have more sodium reuptake. How does that occur? Aldosterone, right? Because again, aldosterone is going to cause more sodium reuptake. What does that do to potassium? Actually decreases it, right? That's why we saw aldosterone antagonists. Cause hyperkalemia. Okay, good. What else does it do? How does it regulate blood pressure? It's a vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II is a very potent vasoconstrictor. What else does it do? Metabolizes uh, bradykinin. Yeah, angiotensin converting enzyme does metabolize bradykinin, which is normally what? Usually vasodilatory, if anything, right? So again, you can find that by, um, um, you know, you can see some effects with that, but it's kind of a minor effect. What else does it do to regulate blood pressure? It also increases the sympathetic nervous system activity, right? So again, that increases squeeze on those alpha-1 receptors, causing vasoconstriction. It's also going to increase ADH release. ADH is going to do what? Holds on to more water, right? So it's going to put more of the aquaporin channels into the collecting duct and hold on to more water. So several things. This is why if you can attack the system, it's very potent in dropping blood pressure because it works on so many different aspects of the body here. This is why it's so important to, to uh, affect this. And again, what is the main stimulus for releasing renin? Um, well, what's what's a stronger, because where does renin come from? The kidneys, right? So what does the kidney have to detect? Low flow, low pressure, low salt, right? Remember, there's that macula densa, those juxtaglomerular cells. They're going to be detecting low flow, low pressures, low sodium, and they're going to say, hey, wait a second, we need to perfuse these kidneys better. Okay, so what's it going to do? Well, it's going to release renin. That's going to increase production of angiotensin. That's going to produce a conversion of angiotensin 1 to 2. And then you have the vasoconstrictive effects. Okay? That's the main thing. Remember, we were talking about the renal tubule, uh, the, uh, actually the renal blood flow. They have the glomerulus. You have the afferent arterial and have the efferent arterial. What does this angiotensin 2 affect? Who said prostaglandins dilate the afferent arterial? That actually increases kidney blood flow. It squeezes the efferent, right? Because, again, it's vasoconstrictive. What does that do to pressure in the glomerulus? It goes up because it's going to be like putting a kink in the hose, right? So, again, it's going to build up pressure there, and it's going to increase GFR. So, again, the kidneys are then satisfied, and they say, okay, well, we have enough pressure here now. Now we can go ahead and decrease renin release. So, see how it's kind of a negative feedback loop? 
that you've covered before. That's homeostasis we're talking about here, right? So again, these are all the effects we're going to be seeing. This is where we're going to be attacking this, uh, either by directly affecting the production of angiotensin II or blocking the receptors it's going to be affecting, okay? That's what we're going to be doing here. So anyway, and you can see this, the kidneys produce renin, angiotensin gets converted over to angiotensin 1, and then you have angiotensin converting enzyme. This is one of the main enzymes we're going to focus on. Is going to lead to a uh, breakdown, uh, or a conversion of 1 to 2, and this is the main vasoconstrictor here. Normally, bradykinin tends to be a vasodilator, but if I have angiotensin converting enzyme, this will actually break it down, right? It'll actually inactivate it, and that's where you see even more vasoconstriction from, okay? So anyway, you're going to see more aldosterone release. You're going to see more vasoconstriction. This is why blood pressure goes up. Not only the actual constriction of the vessels, but the blood volume goes up as well, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, the renal baroreceptors, the macula densa, um, and also the sympathetic nervous system are all going to be affecting the renal angiotensin system. Okay, So all of these are going to have very direct controls of that. But the main driver is going to be the kidneys there, so kind of the biggest one. So as I mentioned, decreased renal, uh, renal perfusion detected by those baroreceptors is going to cause increased renal release. Also, the macula densa is detecting that sodium. So sodium's down, right? It's going to say, hey, we need more flow here. We're going to need some more salt in here. Let's go ahead and increase that efferent constriction to get more our, our GFR up, essentially. Okay. Again, increasing, uh, uh, you know, renal release is going to increase sympathetic nervous system effects. Now, typically, when you think of the sympathetic nervous system, what does that do to renal blood flow? Typically decreases, right? So it's kind of fighting itself in, in some respects because it will typically cause constriction of what? The afferent arterial, right? So again, remember prostaglandins and, and uh, norepinephrine are kind of fighting each other a little bit. Prostaglandins will dilate, whereas uh, norepinephrine will kind of constrict that afferent arterial. So again, because, why, why do we care about that? Yeah, so if you're in a very hyperadrenergic sort of state, you want to hold on to blood, right? You want to hold on to blood volume because you got to perfuse it places. So by decreasing that flow to the kidney, guess what? You're producing less urine. You have more blood volume, right? So, and, and again, when the body is desperate, where does it want to perfuse preferentially? What two organs? The heart and the head. The kidneys can take can take a, a back seat to that, you right? However, we know that by doing that, you're also going to be releasing more renin to try to get that pressure back up, right? So it's kind of uh, this kind of sick cycle that'll occur here in these patients that are kind of chronically hyperadrenergic. Patients are going to have chronic uh, kidney issues. You're going to see that the renin angiotensin system is typically very well ramped up. Okay, um, little things to think about. So anyway, so looking at these effects, it's going to cause vasoconstriction. It's going to increase aldosterone release. We've already talked about that. Uh, vasoconstriction of the efferent arterial. It's going to uh, eventually inhibit renal release. That's that negative feedback loop we mentioned. And then increase that sympathetic outflow. Okay, so all things we've already talked about. Uh, additionally, we're going to find that ADH release is going to go up as well. So it's also going to hold on to more fluid. It doesn't have really a direct effect on, on salt at the kidney level, but what does it do to your salt intake overall? ADH release. It's that thirst response, right? So again, it's going to say, hey, we need to intake more salt. It's going to intake more water as well. Um, have you ever seen anyone who's had a, a case of SIADH? You guys ever heard of that? What's that called? Or what's, a, what's that stand for? That's actually the opposite of diabetes insipidus. Yeah, so SIADH is a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone release. So you're actually releasing too much of it. You'll never see anyone as thirsty as these patients who have SIDH. So you would see this a lot after either like a stroke patient would uh, develop this or if you had like a head trauma. These patients were so thirsty, they would lie, cheat, steal, sell their grandma to get some Gatorade. They would sell their grandma because they were just so thirsty. So you'd have these people, you have to like lock them in their room pra practically to keep them from sneaking out to go down to the cafeteria. And you have your family members come by, just give me some Gatorade, just give me anything, I'm just so thirsty. But that's one of the treatments actually is like to withhold uh, fluid and, and salt for those patients. But I'll just show you that, that that thirst reflex, you're going to be intaking more water, and guess what that does to blood volume? It goes up, and you're also going to be increasing blood pressure in those cases there. So ADH is very important from that standpoint. Other big thing here to note as well is that the cell tissue hypertrophy and cardiac remodeling after MI. So when I say remodeling, what does that mean? So it's like moving like the desk around, get the feng shui going. Yeah, it's a hypertrophy. So again, after an MI, what is an MI? Myocardial infarction. So again, I have infarcted those cells. Probably they died off, right? So what am I going to replace those with? Scar tissue, right? Okay, scar tissue, is that going to be very good at uh, pumping blood? Yeah. No, right? Again, uh, the heart's having a hard time pumping from the left ventricle, right? It's got so much afterload they're trying to press against. What's it going to do? It's going to hypertrophy, right? So you're going to get a big, thick, really not very um, uh, not very compliant sort of muscle there. That's all kind of mediated through angiotensin too, which is why when you give these to patients post-MI, you see less remodeling occurring. You keep that ventricle kind of working better for longer. It doesn't reverse the effects, right? You can't get back that dead tissue. You can't you know, necessarily decrease the hypertrophy, but you can hopefully stave it off for longer. So one of the big things you're going to see here is that patients who are post-MI, they're going to have increased survival 
decreased mortality when they're on an ACE inhibitor. That's going to be one of the required drugs they need to be on. And again, when you're discharging a patient home after MI, there's a list of drugs they have to be on. Otherwise, insurance companies are going to come back and be like, well, what the heck are you doing here, right? You're not taking care of the patient correctly. You know, you're not going to get paid for this sort of thing, right? So these are things you have to be looking for, these metrics. So why can't they just stop using Basically, angiotensin II is going to be one of those uh, stimuli. It's going to be one of those things that will help to um, increase the hypertrophy. It will help to start to change some of that, that tissue over to where it's going to be more th uh, thick and stiff rather than being nice and compliant where it normally is. So again, it's just the effect of angiotensin II. Uh, I'm not sure the actual biochemical changes that are occurring here, but it, we just know that this occurs, right? We talk to a cardiologist and we probably can tell you a whole lot more than I could, right? But I do know that it will decrease mortality in these patients there. So that's why it's so, so important for CHF patients, really, really important for MI patients, okay? So these are things that you're going to need to be on. Okay, so like you said, um, overactivity over the long term is going to lead to hypertension. It's going to lead to things like congestive heart failure, right? Because again, um, why do we get congestive heart failure? Fluid retention. Fluid retention. So too much preload and we have too much... Afterload, you're stressing the heart out, right? It's going to hypertrophy. It's going to get, you know, normally you think hypertrophy of muscles is a good thing. It's a protective reflex, but again, this is leading the heart to be less efficient, right? So that's why you see things like injection fraction go down over time because it's just not pumping as well as it used to. Um, it's also why we see diabetic nephropathies. So why do you think this would occur? Yeah, so, so the efferent arterial is going to be constricted by having this angiotensin too. So what does that do to the pressure at the glomerulus? It's going to go up, right? And again, you have these diabetic patients who are hyperglycemic most of the time. That glucose is going there and just kind of shredding that glomerulus. So basically, you're going to find that that's one of the complications of diabetes. That this nephropathy that occurs over time that can lead to chronic kidney disease. So one of the things you're going to see is that also diabetics need to be on an ACE inhibitor because this is going to be nephroprotective. So again, this is good for helping to protect the kidneys and good for protecting the heart. This is why these drugs are so good, right? This is why we like to keep them around. This is why they're blockbuster sort of drugs. That's why there's like 14 different ones, right? Because they have such good effects. Everyone wants to make some money off of this, right? Okay. And again, anything that inhibits the RAS system is going to have significant effects on morbidity and mortality. So these are why we harp on these much. Um, so looking at inhibiting that ACE enzyme. So if we can inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme, we're going to decrease ANG2 vasoconstriction. We decrease that renal vasoconstriction. This is going to be important for a big side effect. We'll see a little bit later on. You'll see less aldosterone, which is good. You're going to see less sodium reabsorption. You're going to have less ANG2 mediated uh, norepinephrine release. All these good things. You're going to see less bradykinin metabolism. We said bradykinin is already vasodilatory, so that can help with the blood pressure as well. And you're going to find um, that even though you're going to have this negative feedback loop is going to try to make more renin, you're still blocking that enzyme. So you're going to find that ultimately this is very, very effective at preventing um, overactivity of the angiotensin, uh, renin angiotensin system. So um, looking at the ACE inhibitors, they all have identical mechanisms. Really, the only big differences between them is maybe the half-life. Some of them are a little bit longer than others. Um, some of them may be metabolized, maybe mostly from renal versus hepatic metabolism. Again, there's a lot of different flavors of these. Um, don't worry so much about them being pro-drugs. Just know that some of them actually are pro-drugs. If you ever see um, the drug enalapril, you ever heard of that one? Uh, there's another version called enalaprilat. That's actually the IV form that we give. And that makes sense because, again, for a pro-drug to be metabolized to its active form, where does it go through typically? Through the liver, right? Well, if I'm given an IV, is it going to hit the liver first? No, right? So that's why I give the activated form when you're given IV. So if you ever see enalaprilat or a drug called Vasotec, that's the actual uh, the active form, right? We're not giving the pro-drug in that case. Again, just a little uh, bit of trivia there. So um, just to give you some examples of different agents. And again, you don't have to memorize whether they're pro-drugs or not. Um, one thing I will note here is that Captopril has a pretty short half-life. So this is one of those ones that may not be good for kind of chronic management for these patients because they'll have to take it multiple times a day. Usually one that has a little bit longer half-life, and that way they only have to take it once, and they're good to go. Sometimes we use Captopril for very acute uh, if they have a patient who's acutely hypertensive, we need to get their pressure down quick. Sometimes we use Captopril. We actually use it underneath the tongue to try to get their pressures down quick. But... Again, how can you identify an ACE inhibitor? Pril. pril at the end. That's all you need to know, right? So it has a pril in the end. You know it's going to have uh, be an ACE inhibitor. You already know what mechanism of the action uh, action is going to have. We're already going to talk about the the side effects here in just a minute and what that's going to do, right? So you have trandolopril, focinopril, benazapril. As long as you see a pril, you know it's an ACE inhibitor. Quinapril, ramapril, right? So again, a lot of different companies were making these because they said, hey, these are blockbuster medications. Like we need to go ahead and get our own version out there. Again, they all work exactly the same. But just know if you see the pril, it's ACE inhibitor. Okay. Um, again, as I mentioned, most of these are once a day, which is why, again, they're nice from a compliance standpoint for hypertensive patients. If they only have to take one pill a day, it's going to be very good from a compliance standpoint. 
typically you're going to find that they have a pretty steep dose response curve at the lower level. So you can kind of range ramp up the, the dose, but at a certain point, it's going to plateau off, right? There's only so much inhibition you can do with that ACE enzyme. And so you'll tend to flatten off. So again, when you see something like, you know, if you're, just to give you an example, like uh, Lasix, right? So we have Lasix working in the kidneys. I can, you know, give 20 milligrams of Lasix. If that's not working, I give 40. I give 80. Sometimes I even see 160 being given, right? It's a huge dose, but um, you see a pretty steady response with that. If I keep increasing the dose, I see more effect. With something like this, if I have like, say, 5 milligrams of lisinopril is not working, I can go to 10, I can go to 20, but really anything beyond that doesn't really do me any good. So again, follow your dosing guidelines. If a patient's already on maximal dose, don't go any further beyond that because you're only going to increase side effects but not really see any more effects on the blood pressure, okay? So as I mentioned, the therapeutic uses here, very good for hypertension. You're going to be decreasing the total peripheral resistance, right? Because again, you're decreasing that squeeze on the vessels because uh, you're getting rid of angiotensin 2, you're getting rid of some of that norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system. And also you're going to be seeing decreased left ventricular hypertrophy by decreasing the afterload, right? Again, afterload is what the heart's having to pump again. So if you're decreasing that pressure, you're going to relieve some of that effect on the heart. Which again is good because by relieving some of that work on the heart, it's going to stay going to be working more efficiently for longer, right? So you're not wearing out the heart so early. And again, this is also going to be really preferred in diabetic patients because it is nephroprotective. Okay, so if I asked you a question on a test that said, hey, you have a newly diagnosed hypertensive patient, he has a history of type 2 diabetes, and, you know, well controlled on insulin, what's the next uh, best medication to start him on for, uh, for hypertension? ACE never is going to be a great option there, right? Because we can help to hopefully preserve that kidney function as long as we can. Can't reverse it, but we can hopefully preserve it a little bit longer. Well, you, you're first. Oh, you, you wanted to go first? Ladies first? Okay. It's a high pressure, all that glucose again, like sent those, all this fenestrations. It's, yeah, so you're going to find um, just like by relieving the pressure on the heart, you can hopefully keep it healthy for longer. You're relieving the pressure on the glomerulus, right? That's going to help it keep it healthy for longer. Same exact function there, right? Good. Um, so as I mentioned, very nephroprotective, good for now, looking at other uses, if you have a patient with CHF or left ventricular dysfunction, this is great because it helps to prevent some of that remodeling in that hypertrophy that occurs here. Um, it's going to decrease that vascular resistance and the afterload, as I mentioned already. Um, you'll have a little bit of effects of decreasing the preload, mainly just due to the fact um, you're going to find a little bit more capacitance in, in the, uh, on the venous side of things. But again, that's going to be a minor effect compared to the afterload sort of, uh, of actions there. As I mentioned, you're going to delay the progression of CHF, right? And again, we have huge studies, thousands of patients we followed that shows us this. Um, we're going to have decreased uh, or delay of progression. You're going to have decreased incidence incidence of MI and hospitalizations. All really good things, right? The more you can keep it out of the hospital, the better it's going to be. So anyone with LV dysfunction probably should be on ACE inhibitor unless otherwise specified, right? Let's have some contraindication that prevents that. Okay. Post MI, these patients should also be on an ACE inhibitor because it's going to help to decrease that remodeling and decreases overall mortality. So again, other very good drugs for these patients to be on. As I mentioned, diabetic nephropathy, just decreasing that pressure there at the glomerulus. It's going to help prevent uh, further progression of, of disease in those patients there, right? Slows it down, doesn't completely stop it or reverse it necessarily, okay? You have to get their other problems in check, like the hypertension, like their, di um, their diabetes, all that in check first. So side effects of ACE inhibitors. It'd be nice if these were perfect drugs and no side effects, but we do know there are issues with it. So I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this, maybe their dad or their loved ones or someone like this. Dry cough is a super common thing you see with ACE inhibitors, okay? And the reason for that is, is because you actually have this buildup of bradykinin. By inhibiting ACE uh, from working, you're going to be inhibiting the breakdown of bradykinin, so that's going to build up. That tends to cause this dry cough in patients, right? And sometimes it's not even the patients that really notice it so much, but oftentimes it's their loved ones. I remember my cousin got started on an ACE inhibitor at one point in his life, and then his wife was like, we have to get him off of this because I cannot handle this coughing and hacking all night long. So, okay, let's get him on something else, right? So that's why he switched over to another class, which we'll talk about in a moment here. But dry cough is a big thing. And again, you may see it a little bit more frequently in women who are on ACE inhibitors here, but oftentimes this is the thing that's going to help um, get them convert over to something else because of the fact that it is so kind of constant, it's a dry, hacky cough, it's just not good from a quality of life standpoint. Now, hyperkalemia, why do you think this would cause hyperkalemia? So, right, and specifically, what is it inhibiting? Aldosterone. aldosterone, right? So by inhibiting aldosterone secretion, you're going to cause more sodium to be released, you're going to be holding on to more potassium, right? This is important because who do I say we're going to give this to? Patients with what kind of issues? Kidney, kidney issues, right? And again, kidney patients typically have uh, what sort of electrolyte disturbances? 
you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna find their potassium levels are gonna be high. They typically have hyperkalemia. So again, this can worsen that. So you have to really watch their initial BMP, right? Their basic metabolic panel to see what their potassium is at baseline. If it's already five and a half, maybe starting an ACE inhibitor is not gonna be good for them. Anyone know what the normal range for potassium is? Yeah, 3.5 to 5. It's a good, easy range to remember. Um, anything above 5, you may maybe a little hesitant to start them on that, right? Or maybe look at their other medications that may be affecting this. But again, think about if you had a patient who was on, say, a thiazide diuretic, and then you put them on an ACE inhibitor. Maybe that balances it out, right? Because again, the thiazide will cause hypokalemia, have this causing hyperkalemia. Maybe sometimes they balance out. That's okay, right? That's why very frequently you'll see these two in used in combination. Perhaps there might be a prescription assignment you'll have that, and we'll have that on there, right? There you go, see? Very much trial and error because it depends on their kidney function at kind of a baseline. Um, patients with good kidney function at baseline are going to be able to tolerate this very well. They can compensate for that increase in potassium and you won't see much change at all. Uh, other patients are going to find that if they have poor kidney function, they can't really regulate it that well and you may see big, big spikes there, right? Especially when you combine it with other medications that can affect it as well, okay? That's why it's so important because I, you know, I probably will ask a question on the test to say which one of these would be contraindicated in a patient with a potassium of blank, right? So again, if I say a patient has a potassium of, say, 2.9, and I'll give you the normal range. I'll say three and a half to five. Um, I'll say which one of these would be contraindicated, right? And so I'll give you three of them that will increase potassium and one that will decrease it. And your job would be to say, okay, let's Lasix, right? I would not give them Lasix for that patient, okay? Um, or I could say, hey, I have a patient with a, a potassium of 5.6 or six. Um, you know, which one of these would be contraindicated? I'll give you three that lower the potassium and one, or I guess four that lower potassium and the one that increases it. Your job is to make sure you can identify which one of those are going to affect potassium in one way versus the other. So most diuretics, but not all diuretics, right? because we already went over those. Uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, we'll cover in a second here. They're going to raise potassium. These are things you need to think about, right? Because, again, I could just ask you a question, which one of these causes hyperkalemia? It's all well and good, but I'd rather be able to say, well, apply it to this patient, right? So identify, okay, he's got hyperkalemia. Which one of these drugs is inappropriate for that patient? Because that's what you're going to do when you're actually out there in the real world. I have a mnemonic for this one, ACE. So name is ACE, so A for angiodema, C for cough, yep. and E for elevated potassium. I think the E is a little bit of a stretch there. Yeah. It's okay. It was like, ACK. ACK would be pretty good, right? No, it's kidding. No, that's very good. Yeah, any kind of, uh, you guys are like the mnemonic kings of, uh, kings and queens I've noticed here, so that's very good. Um, yeah, I, I uh, had one one uh, classmate that would always come up. We had to like, remember the, the entire Krebs cycle, and uh, they had some like enormously long sort of mnemonic. We I remember just for that test, and I completely dumped it. I was, it was about some man from Kentucky and something he did, and it was just it was ridiculous. But uh, whatever works for you, fantastic. I like, I like it. Okay, other effects you're going to see uh, hypotension, right? Typically, you're going to see this more with like the first dose, and so this is why sometimes. And again, what happens when you have hypotension? What are some of the uh, kind of initial effects? Dizziness, right, because that's what? Lack of blood flow to the head, right? So you have decreased pressures and dizziness. You can also see what? Syncope, which is going to lead to falls, right? So again, you have an older patient, you start this, you give them too big of a dose, all of a sudden they get dizzy, they fall, guess what? Break their hip, guess what? Now they're in a wheelchair the rest of their life, right? Who knows, right? So sometimes these fractures can be completely debilitating, right? So these older patients, so uh, they never regain that function afterwards. So you have to be really, really careful. Anytime you're giving antihypertensive medications, these older patients, they really don't have a lot of hemodynamic reserve left over, right? Be really, really careful with that. Um, so again, with uh, all things with dealing with the blood pressure, start low and go slow. You got to start a little bit lower and gently titrate up. That's okay. You can get their blood pressure under control. Guess what? They've probably been hypertensive for a long time. They're probably not going to die in the next six weeks or so while you kind of build them up. Hopefully not, right? That's not just, never say never, but hopefully you can kind of build them up over time, okay? Um, and again, this is going to be more in uh, sodium-depleted patients, you know, uh, if they have CHF or if there are multiple medications, right? Especially multiple drugs that have different mechanisms. You see some synergy there. So be careful with that. Another big thing. So we talked about big drugs that will cause renal dysfunction. What did we talk about before? What kind of normal like, over-the-counter drugs you may run into can cause an acute decrease in kidney function? NSAID, right? Especially, that's not necessarily in healthy patients, right? I can give most of you an NSAID. Nothing would happen to your GFR, right? You can compensate for that. But an older patient who maybe has very poor kidney function, they're really dependent on those prostaglandins to keep their, their renal, uh, their GFR up, right? So if I give them an NSAID, knock that out, guess what? GFR is going to go down precipitously, cause an acute kidney injury. The flip side of it can happen with ACE inhibitors. So again, some of these patients who are chronically hypertensive, chronically kind of been shredding the kidneys over all these years, um, they really require that angiotensin II to keep that pressure up in glomerulus. What happens if I take that away? They lose all that back pressure, and all of a sudden you're going to find they're not going to be able to filter very well. The GFR will go down as well. So again, be careful giving this in patients who have kidney disease. However, what did I say this does to kidney function? 
preserves it, right? So again, this is one of those things where you have to be careful because again, it's good for the kidneys, but you got to start low and go slow, right? So again, be very careful of this. Um, again, you can see that acute drop, just give a low dose and gently titrate up, okay? It's always going to be the rule here. You can always give more, hard to take it back once you give it, okay? It's a good, good rule of thumb there. Okay. Other things, uh, some rare effects you may see is but very serious effects, right? So angioedema, Okay, so it goes to the A with your, your mnemonic there. Um, it's pretty rare, but this is where you can see this. Uh, we're going to have a very significant throat swelling. Uh, uh, basically, the whole kind of uh, oral mucosa is going to be swelling up. It looks like a true anaphylactic reaction. It's a little different in the mechanism. A lot of this is due to bradykinin. Um, however, what's the thing I, I worry about most of these patients having all the swelling? Airway loss, right? So again, these are those patients where you really have to um, be aggressive with them, oftentimes get an airway early, because otherwise, once they swell up, guess what you got to do? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we want to intubate them early, but if we, if we lose that ability to intubate, you got to crack them, right? And we don't want to do that. I remember one guy, he came in, he had a known history of angioedema, but he was really worried about his blood pressure. He said, I'm going to go ahead and start this ACE inhibitor again anyway. Came in, just tongue sticking all the way out of his mouth. I mean, he was uh, very, very close to losing his airway, but very awake, very coherent. We ended up having to use a fiber optic scope going through nasally in order to get an airway uh, for that patient there. And so we had to give him a little bit of ketamine to kind of anesthetize him. We were able to eventually get the airway, but it was very close. We had the cry kit out, ready to go. Fortunately, we did not need it, right? So again, be very aggressive with these patients if you notice this. Uh, if they are ever on a nasal inhibitor and they develop this, don't ever put them on, don't challenge them again, right? Because it's, it's mo most likely to happen to those patients the second time, okay? Um, not a true anaphylactic reaction, but I would definitely put this on their allergy list. Say, so, hey, they've had this before. They had angioedema. I would not challenge them again, okay? Other things, um, do not give this to pregnant patients, right? Increase fetal uh, morbidity, mortality, um, cause fetal uh, defects, birth, uh, death. We don't want to do this, right? Um, Can we give this in first trimester because it doesn't fit first trimester? You know, I would say that it's probably... Yeah, so again, it'd be absolutely contraindicated there. There may be a case where maybe it like goes from like a D category to an X category. Uh, I still wouldn't push it, right? So again, it's one of those things where if, you know, my wife or my sister was ever pregnant, I would never give them an ACE inhibitor, right? There's other drugs that would be considered first line. We'll cover those when we get to the OB-GYN section later on, right? Um, but again, just because it says second and third, I probably wouldn't even push it for the first one, right? Especially that first trimester is so important for organogenesis and all these things. I wouldn't. How about like when they have a bilateral renal artery stenosis? That's tough because again, when they have that renal artery stenosis, um, again, giving them this could, especially too big of a dose, uh, could potentially cause that decrease in pressure and could cause an issue. But um, I don't, you'd have to talk to somebody like a nephrologist or uh, somebody who deals with hypertension more frequently. But uh, I would say you could probably start very low dose and, and titrate right up, and they could probably respond to that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a rare case of I, I would definitely consult with someone else before I would make a, a final decision there or check out the data at the very least, right? Anywho, um, other effects. Remember, um, NSAIDs are going to be able to blunt the effects of the uh, ACE inhibitors here. It's more of an uh, interaction you're going to find than anything else. Um, but a lot of that is due to the fact that the prostaglandin be kind of um, uh, they'll be decreased. We have an NSAID on board. We'll be kind of counteracting the effects of the ACE inhibitor. Okay. Um, so if we can't use an ACE inhibitor, let's say they have a history of angioedema or, um, or they have that dry cough, we can switch them over to something called an angiotensin receptor blocker. These are basically going to be working um, uh, through a different mechanism. Instead of inhibiting the conversion of ang one to ang 2 we're going to allow that to occur, but instead block them off at the receptors. And again, these are therapeutically interchangeable. They still have a lot of evidence behind them, but maybe not quite as much as the ACE inhibitors. So I would feel very comfortable switching any patient from one to the other uh, if they had you know, the dry cough or anything like that. But why do you think an uh, ARB angiotensin receptor blocker would not cause that cough because it's not affecting the ACE enzyme, thus it's not affecting bradykinin, right? So I don't ever have that buildup of bradykinin. That also means what do you think that does to your chances of angioedema? Probably decreases it as well, right? So again, some patients, they may be safely transitioned if they have a history of angioedema. The cross-reactivity here is very low. There may still be some chance, but it's pretty low for the most part if you were to switch them over to an ARB. So that could be think, one thing you may try for uh, some patients there. Some people may be a little bit more hesitant to try that. Um, but the dry cough thing, for sure, switch them over to an ARB, it should go away for the most part. Okay, uh, Unless that's some other reason to be coughing. And so um, angiotensin 1 receptors are going to be the ones that we're mainly focusing on. That's one main, uh, most of our drugs are targeted against. Um, AT2 is going to be more expressed um, in the fetal development, which is why you end up seeing some issues there on the developing fetus. And again, these will also be contraindicated in pregnancy, right? So and again, just imagine here by blocking the AT1 receptor, this is going to affect the vasoconstriction, the sodium reabsorption, aldosterone, all those things. 
we're already talking about. And these will also still affect that cell proliferation, which means uh, we can affect the hypertrophy. We can help with the kidney uh, protective uh, features there. Uh, these are going to work very much therapeutically interchangeable to the ACE inhibitors. So again, think about them uh, being in. Um, again, very high affinity here, very similar effects. Again, I'm not going to belabor these points. But um, the drugs we have here, and how, do you, how can you tell an ARB versus anything else? Yeah, you're going to see artin on the end there, right? Um, or sartin, you can say. So, again, things like candesartin, olmosartin. Again, this is another one of those kind of blockbuster group of drugs where they said, okay, we want to get a Me Too drug on there, which is why there's so many of them, right? Um, so, you see many, many varieties. Again, acylsartin, eprosartin, herbosartin. Some of these you're going to run into more commonly than others. It just depends on where you work, what the insurances are going to be covering, what you're kind of getting familiar with. You know, for instance, like, you know, I probably see mostly, you know, losartin, candesartin, herbosartin. Valsart, maybe. Those are like the main, main the four ones I run into. But it just depends on where you're at and, and what they have available, right? Um, does anyone know which one of these was in the news recently? Isn't it E-Darby? Or no? Hmm? Is it E-Darby? E-Darby? No, it wasn't that one. Well, it might have been, but I wasn't aware of it. So there's a big recall on uh, on Valsart, and there's actually uh, something to do with the chemical um, synthesis of it. They actually found that there was a byproduct that was made by one of these uh, manufacturers, um, this generic manufacturer, that uh, a possibly carcinogenic product was being formed there. Right, it wasn't like someone accidentally like knocked over the test tube of carcinogen into it, but it was actually produced in the actual synthesis of it, and so it actually got pulled off the market. So this is a big deal from the from a provider and a pharmacy standpoint, because guess what? If you have a bunch of patients on Valsart and you've been prescribing it for years, guess what? Every one of them has to get switched over. So as a pharmacist, can I just switch them over to a different ARB? Mm -mm, that's not in my purview. That is your purview. So it means I got to call every single provider up for every patient on Valsart and say, Hey, this got recalled. What do you want to put them on? So that's good that you're going to be able to be familiar with these different drugs. Say, okay, well, I can't use this one. What, do, what can I switch to, right? And so, again, it's a good two-way dialogue between you and the pharmacist to say, well, let's try this one instead. Let's try Herbisartan. Let's try Candisartan, whatever the case may be, uh, to find the right drug for your patient there, right? So, again, these things can come up. So you may think a recall sounds kind of boring, but it could affect you pretty significantly if you deal with a lot of these patients here. Um, any of them would be fine. I think, um, like, for instance, my cousin was on Valsartan. He got switched over to Herbisartan. He's fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what the cost is. I mean, my patient doesn't have any money to pay for uh, insurance. Like, you know, I need to find what's on the $4 list. I need to find what's maybe on like a free list somewhere. I mean, you're going to have uh, pretty ready access to these resources. And again, depending on where you're working, and again, we're kind of gearing you more towards that family practice, urgent care kind of setting. Um, you need to be familiar with those resources, right? So you can say, well, you know, I know my patient doesn't have a whole lot of money. Where can I kind of funnel them to to get the right drug? This is going to work for them. You know, um, you can get lisinopril super cheap, I think, at like Publix and Walmart, but they can't be on that. And maybe they need our, our, uh ARB instead, maybe it's only herbicide is our only option. So they're all interchangeable. Exactly, therapeutically interchangeable. The potencies might differ a little bit, so the dose may change, which is why you can look that stuff up, right? So again, that's why I don't harp on the doses so much here, because you can find that stuff out. You can just look it up. Uh, at least be familiar with the drug. So, okay, well, I know I can't use this one. What are my other options here, right? I can switch over to something like Candesartin, Herbisartin, et cetera. Good. Again, same exact, um, you know, therapeutic uses here, hypertension. You know, very, very good uh, from that standpoint. Again, it's going to be working just as effectively as an ACE inhibitor overall, right? So therapeutically interchangeable here. No point in belaboring these points. Similar, use it for LV dysfunction, right? It's going to decrease that remodeling. Use it for diabetic nephropathy. It's going to preserve kidney function. Same thing as ACE inhibitors. Same hyperkalemia you're going to see, right? Because you're going to be decreasing aldosterone secretion, right? Same hypotension you're going to see there. The same first dose effect. When do you think it's the best time to give, a, a, say, an older patient uh, a new dose of uh, antihypertensive? What time of day? The morning or they're up and active nighttime. nighttime yeah you give it to them before bed so that way they're asleep hopefully for most of that one thing i'd be careful of is that when you start a diuretic overnight guess what they're going to want to do yeah. you get up and go to the bathroom all the time it's dark and you know you're kind of like stumbling around dreary eyed right my house is like a booby trap because all the toys are in the floor now <laughs> can't tell me times i stepped on this plastic horse every single night Right. So, again, it's one of those things where you have an older patient, like, you know, maybe the a grandparent, maybe they got the kids around. Um, that can be problematic. Right. So think about the drugs. Think about the effects you're going to have. Right. Think about the, the, the secondary effects you may not even think about initially. Right. Diuretics at I probably would avoid diuretics at nighttime, probably get that during the daytime. Right. So that way uh, they're not having to make them get up and go pee uh, three or four times a night. You know, depending on the patient may already be getting up that much anyway. Right. So just maybe worsening it. And again, don't give this to pregnant patients. Um, again, the big things here is it does not cause cough, and it may have a, a pretty low incidence uh, of angioedema. So again, you may be able to switch a patient from an ACE inhibitor over to this, and that could be um, pretty safe for them for the most part. Okay, very low cross reactivity there, because again, the bradykinin effects. Yes, ma'am. If you were taking, if somebody was, um, one of your patients was taking a diuretic currently at night, and 
they were complaining to you about how they have to pee, could you, is it just as easy for you to just say, well, why don't you just start taking it during the day? Like, is it okay for them to just switch it like that? Yeah, so the question is, like, well, how often are they taking it, right? So, again, if they were taking it, say, twice a day, so they're doing twice daily Lasix for, you know, their fluid management for their CHF, right? So maybe instead of taking it, you know, right as they get up and right before they go to bed, maybe they take it, like, maybe right in the morning and then maybe right at dinner time or something, right? So that way, you know, because, again, you think about Lasix. Okay, Lasix lasts six hours. Okay, well, by the time it's midnight, it should be out of their system for the most part. Little things like that you'll think about. It's only one time a day. think once, like, once in the morning and then in the evening. Yeah, again, it's not an exact science, right? It's yeah. all art, right? So again, you have to kind of try it and see how the patient responds and go from there. That's why um, that's why we send you on rotations. So you can see a bunch of these patients over and over and over again and see, okay, well, this guy reacted this way, but this lady reacted this way. You know, you can kind of compare and contrast, and that's how you kind of really get a good feel for how to how to manage these things, right? You know, because again, I can learn about Tylenol poisoning one time, but until I've actually treated dozens and dozens and dozens of Tylenol overdoses or snake bites or whatever, I didn't really get a good feel for it and, and, and you know, be able to deal with all these patients that present similarly but just a little different what do i do in this case what do, I do in this case so you'll get a feel for it over time um but again if it's one time a day and they're taking it at nighttime switch them over to daytime see how it goes for them there right have them check their blood pressures have them you know monitor their weight for their fluid retention things like that you're gonna be monitoring for okay all right yes sir I wouldn't say less side effects. It's really just the cough is a big difference there, and that doesn't affect every patient. Um, so for the most part, I would say you're probably safe, and it's probably cheaper to start with the ACE inhibitor, and if that doesn't work, then switch them over. Yeah, so I think most patients are probably safe to start with the ACE inhibitor. Um, the ACE inhibitors, do they have better um, kidney protection than the heart? I don't know that there's any studies that says one's better than the other. Um, it's more that we probably have... Because those were first, we probably have bigger studies or longer studies that show that if, yeah, there's probably more, a little bit more evidence. Um, but as far as, you know, our purposes go, they're, they're going to be just as effective. I mean, I'd probably start with the ACE inhibitor. That didn't work for the patient. You're probably going to get similar effects. Maybe not as perfect. Who knows? Maybe better. Mm -hmm. Who can say? We don't have the studies to necessarily show that. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Other questions? All right. I will let you go on a 10-minute break. We'll come back and continue on with the calcium channel blockers. And again, I'll start probably like five minutes or stop five minutes before the end of class and I'll go over those questions just so we can kind of review them together. If that works for you all. Um, all right, so Cal, are any questions before I continue on? Yes, sir. Can you just clarify just real quick how angiotensin 2 affects the kidneys? Mm -hmm. so yep, yep, okay. So let me, let me draw this real quick with my poor drawing skill. So imagine you got the glomerulus, right? Let's just say. Again, very poor drawing here. Okay, here's a glomerulus, right? And blood flow is going to go in this direction here. So we're going to say blood flow goes this way and out this direction, okay? And some amount of it is going to go down and get filtered, okay? So which one's the afferent versus which one's efferent? Afferent is heading in, right? So this is A. And then efferent is heading out. Good. So if I open up the afferent arterioles, what does that do to my GFR? I have more flow coming in, so that's going to increase GFR, right? So it's kind of increasing the, the preload, so to speak, of the glomerulus. Think about like the heart a little bit. Um, on the efferent side, if I constrict the efferent, what does that do to my GFR? It's almost like increasing the afterload of the glomerulus, so that increases pressure as well, okay? So for instance, if I give uh, something like, if say I have high prostaglandin concentrations in the efferent, or I'm sorry, the afferent, what does that do to that vessel? Dilate, uh, dilates it, right? So again, when you have a patient with poor kidney function, the kidneys are detecting, hey, we don't have enough flow here. Let's go ahead and make more prostaglandins to open that up, right? So we're going to get more flow there. Um, but if I give an NSAID, you lose those prostaglandins, and now it's going to constrict. Or if I'm in a case where I'm, saying a hyperadrenergic state, my sympathetic nervous system is in, in overdrive, it's also going to release norepinephrine on the afferent. And what does that do? Norepinephrine on alpha receptors constricts, right? So we can constrict that down as well, right? So it's going to limit blood flow to the kidneys, but I'm holding on to more fluid. I got more blood volume. I can send more blood flow to my brain and my heart, right? So it's good things, right? Uh, overall, right? Because I'd rather keep those alive and take a hit on the kidneys another way around, right? So that's one way to, uh, to get affect that blood flow there, or the, the GFR. On the efferent side of it, really just think about angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is going to do what to the efferent? It's going to constrict it, right? And that's going to increase that backflow pressure, right? Just like putting a kink in your hose. It's going to increase that pressure there and increase our GFR, okay? If I lose that, if I give an ACE inhibitor an ARB and I lose that angiotensin 2 effect, it's going to dilate. That pressure goes down and that blood flow can go straight through. It doesn't have as much impetus to go down and get filtered there. So that's going to cause an acute decrease in kidney function for someone who just starts on an ACE inhibitor that was really needing that angiotensin 2 to keep that pressure up. 
right? So again, acutely, it can decrease GFR. However, it's good for preserving GFR in the long run for those patients, okay? Just like any antiarrhythmic I give, guess what it can cause? Arrhythmias. Any anti-epileptic I give, guess what it can cause? Seizures. Any, uh, any uh, you know, cancer drug that I give, what can it cause? Cancer, right? So again, these are all double-edged swords, right? So again, it sounds silly that we're like, why the heck are we giving all these really bad drugs? But because we have to balance that risk versus benefit. Okay, so this is what we're learning now, right? How do we use these drugs to make sure we're going to stay, keep our patients safe there, right? Anyway, does that answer the question? Yes. Perfect. Anything else? All right, so moving on. Next, we have our calcium channel blockers. So we have a lot of different types of calcium channels throughout the body. Now, why do we care about calcium channels when it comes to the, the heart and the blood vessels, the cardiovascular system? Contractility is very good. So increased calcium influx is going to increase contractility because you remember in that cardiac cycle, when you have calcium coming into the myocytes, what does that cause? causes calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? And that causes what to occur? Actin and myosin, they're going to bind together, and guess what you get? Contraction, right? Just like the skeletal muscle works, works the same way in the cardiac muscle as well, okay? What about calcium in the vasculature? What type of muscle is around the, the endothelial cells? Smooth muscle, right? So again, remember, smooth muscle is very efficient, but it's very slow acting, right? It's not like a quick beat of a heart. It's very slow, but it's very strong contractions, very long contractions that can keep for a long time. Calcium is still very, very important for that. So if I decrease calcium inflow to the heart, what could that cause? Decreased contractility. We're also going to see it's going to cause decrease in uh, nodal activity. So we're actually going to decrease heart rate as well, we're going to see. And we'll show you that in a second here when you look at the cardiac cycle. Uh, what do you think it's going to do to the vasculature? It's going to vasodilate, right? Because again, we're decreasing calcium influx, so it's going to cause blood pressure to go down, which is why we like these as an antihypertensive, okay? So we're going to run into two main types of calcium channel blockers. We're going to get into two main kind of branches and see how we're going to use these um, in, in different fashions here. But the main type we're focusing on are going to be the L-type calcium channels here, okay? There's lots of other ones that are around, but the ones we really care about are going to be the L-type calcium channels here, right? So again, just think about these. Um, and again, these are going to have big effects on the cardiovascular system. And again, it's important to delineate which ones are going to act where, essentially. So as I mentioned, vascular smooth muscle, cardiac myocytes, and the cardiac nodal tissue, mainly SA node and AV node are the big places that are going to get affected here, okay? So getting back to heart physiology, it's going to be important when we get back. All right, yay, I got one person who's very excited about this. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I've not covered this with you personally in physiology, so I'll give you the crash course, at least as far as it goes from my understanding and my purposes for, for this class. Have you guys covered this elsewhere? Not like this? Well, guess what? It's going to be a brand new day, my friends. Guess what? We're going to do it. So let's look at this. So first off, where do, where does the cardiac action potential start? SA node, right? Right at the top of the heart. SA node down into AV node, right? Which stands between the atria and the ventricles. Good. So that's the thing kind of separating those two, right? Remember, there's that fibrous tissue that separates the atria and the ventricles. Because again, you want every single signal going from the atria straight down. Because again, when you want the heart to beat, you want the ventricles to beat from the top down to the bottom up the bottom up because again they have to pump up to get the blood flow going out right either the pulmonary vessels are going into the aorta where it happens to go okay so looking at that that means we have the the signal going from the sa node the av node travels down what the bundle branch and it separates off which it goes to the purkinje fibers and then by going by causing that the electrical signal to go in that very organized sort of route there we call that a functional sensation right that allows for the heart to be in a very concerted sort of manner so that it works very effectively it's very efficient that's why when you see an arrhythmia and the, heart, the, vet, the ventricles are just quivering it's not very efficient at pumping blood and that's when your patient dies right mm -hmm. so we want to keep the patient going anyway so looking at this you can see we have the sa node and the av node now what do you notice uh, about this tissue is different than the myocytes the other myocytes well they generate their own action potentials right we call these slow response cells Okay, which means they generate their own action potential, right? And again, which one's faster? You think the SA node or the AV node is faster at generating those action potentials? SA node, right? Because again, that's going to be setting, that's a pacemaker, right? So that's going to be setting the pace of the heart. Now, what would happen if I bladed the SA node? The AV node takes over, right? It's a little bit slower, but it still has its own intrinsic, intrinsic activity. What happened if I bladed that? Yeah, then the, you'll have the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers have an even slower rate, but we could still survive probably to some degree. But, so just kind of think, keep that in mind. Anyway, so the big difference with those cells, those are called slow response cells. They will naturally develop their own action potential, okay? All the other myocytes, we call those fast response cells. That means they only are going to fire off in case they have an action potential come along and trigger it, okay? So it means they will sit at the normal resting memory potential until something comes along, and then boom, you have a contraction. 
So keep that in mind. We're going to look at the different electrolytes and how that's going to be affecting this a little bit later, right? This is going to be very important for not only this here with the calcium channel blockers, also when we talk about the antiarrhythmics later on, okay? And again, uh, looking at your normal EKG here, kind of keep in mind the P wave is what? Atrial depolarization, QRS. Ventricular depolarization, T wave is? Yeah, ventricular repolarization. Where's the, where's the atrial repolarization? Yeah, it's covered up, right? QRS is too big because the ventricle is a lot bigger muscle, a lot more electricity, right? Think about that. Okay, so looking at the slow response cells, which you see here, versus the fast response cells. So we're, some things we're going to notice here. Notice here uh, the different role that sodium plays, okay? With these slow response cells, the pacemaker cells, notice there's a slow kind of leaky sodium channels here, right? So notice how it kind of gradually goes up on its own. This is kind of the overall rest, the, the membrane potential for this, uh, this nodal tissue, right? So you're going to notice it's going to naturally kind of go up kind of on its own. And then once you hit that certain threshold, what happens? Boom, you have a contraction there, right? And this is where calcium influx is going to occur, okay? So this is the big thing that causes the rise in electric potential of the slow response cells, the SA node, AV node primarily, is going to be calcium influx. You have slow sodium influx, and then boom, calcium rapidly in, uh, influxes in, okay? Contrast that to the fast response cells. Notice here, they're going to have just this normal resting membrane potential. What triggers this? Usually some sort of uh, action potential from the nodal tissue, it then triggers this off. Notice what it comes in first? Sodium, right? So again, this is where you see sodium is going to uh, influx very quickly. And then calcium plays a role here as well, right? So you're going to see this plateau effect is caused by calcium influx, right? Think about calcium being on a higher concentration on the outside of the cell than it is on the inside. So just naturally, when you open up a calcium channel, it's going to flow in what direction? Inside the cell, right? Because most of the calcium is sequestered in that sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? It's kind of held away. So that way we can allow that passive diffusion to occur. Okay, so calcium is very important for causing the, this kind of phase zero depolarization here for the slow response cells. It is responsible for this plateau phase here in the fast response cells, okay? So if I were to block sodium channel influx into these cells right here, these fast resp or, uh, slow response cells, what do you think would occur to the heart rate? It would slow it down. I'm slowing down this whole depolarization here, right? So actually what you end up seeing is a decrease in heart rate, okay? What would happen if I say decrease the calcium influx here on the fast response cells? Decrease contractility, right? Because remember, when you have this uh, increase in the action potential, you're actually, that's what's causing that squeeze there, right? Because once that depolarization goes up, that calcium's coming in, you're releasing that sarco uh, sarcoplasm reticulum full of calcium, and that causes the actin and the myosin to bind together, and boom, your contraction occurs. So if that's longer, I'm going to hold that onto that contraction for longer, but if I block it, less calcium comes in, guess what? Contractility goes down. So blocking calcium channels on the heart is going to cause bradycardia, it's going to cause decrease in contractility, okay? So again, it's a long way to say, basically causes bradycardia and decreased contractility. So it's a negative chronotrope, negative inotrope. Got me? Chronotrope just means the rate of the heart. The chrono, think time, think beats per minute. Inotrope, think ions, think uh, the electricity, think contractility, right? Yes, ma'am. Why is the graph on the left the one that's the slow response? If it's SA and AD, mm -hmm. I thought those were faster. Uh, what do you mean? How do you mean? Okay, um, like SA node goes faster than yeah. AB. Yep. So I was thinking that those would be the fast ones and then the myocytes would be the slow ones. Well, they're a slow response because they have, they don't, um, these respond very quickly to an action potential, right? Because again, the myocytes, they'll just stay dormant until they have the action potential come along and fire it off, right? They have to hit that threshold in order to have an action potential. These guys, they're going to be the slow response because they're going to have the slow leaky inward sodium and kind of leisurely as the sodium gets to a certain threshold, then you have your action potential. So that's why we call it a slow response cell, basically, because, again, we don't have to worry about really a lot of extrinsic factors on it. They can just beat on their own normal rate. Again, I can affect it, whether I have calcium uh, influx being affected or if I do other things we'll talk about later. Um, yes, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly. So, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so that's why we would use uh, a lot of these, and we'll, we'll get into this into the, into the anti-arrhythmic section. That's why you use a lot of these for uh, atrial arrhythmias, right? So again, you can actually slow down that conduction between the atria and the ventricles and use that for that. You know, you wouldn't use it for a ventricular arrhythmia, but a lot for atrial arrhythmias. But you, we'll talk about that later, later on. All right, so anyway, so um, these calcium channel blockers, the specific ones we'll talk about that affect the cardiac action potential here. It's going to decrease the rate of the heart, decrease contractility. Okay, that'll be important not only in the therapeutic effect, but also the toxic effects we're going to see a little bit later, okay? Keep that in the back of your mind. And again, you can imagine here when you have an action potential occur, this calcium is going to come into the cell, 
It'll release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this is what causes the contraction, right? Once you recycle that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then it relaxes, and then it goes back down to this normal dormant state, okay? Got it? All right. Is that review, or is it more new stuff for you guys? Yeah. Okay, so again, so again, we'll go over this more detail when we get to the antiarrhythmic section as well. So we'll, we'll reiterate this, okay? Um, looking at the, uh, again, if you see less calcium coming into the mycete, less calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, less calcium to cause actin and mycin to bind together, right? That's not happening. Guess what? No contract, uh, contraction is going to occur. And again, this is all in a gradation, right? So again, it's not going to be like an all or none sort of phenomenon. It's going to be a little bit shades of gray there, right? So if I release a little bit less calcium, we get a little less contractility. First, I give way too much calcium channel blocker, we get a lot less contractility, okay? And in fact, when I'm thinking about overdoses, like these are the ones that kind of get my my uh, my uh, my alarm system going, right? I think like calcium channel blocker overdose, I'm really worried about those patients because again, that contractility can be very very uh, detrimental to the patient. Comparing that to the vascular smooth muscle, again, this is going to cause the same effects essentially where you have less calcium coming in to the, uh, to the cell. Less calcium is going to, and again, this uh, should be some review for you guys a little bit with, as far as the vascular, um, or at least how smooth muscle function goes. But just at a baseline for our purposes, just know that less calcium coming into the cell means less calcium is going to cause the actin and the myosin to bind together. It means you're going to have less contraction of that smooth muscle, which means blood pressure will go down. TPR is going to go down when you have this on board, okay? Okay. So looking at the effects on the veins, typically you're going to find that um, we'll talk about things that are arterial dilators versus venodilators. Calcium channel blockers tend to focus more on the arterial side. Those vessels tend to be more sensitive to it than the, uh, the venous vessels are going to be. Okay, So just know that these are better for decreasing afterload, not so good on the preload side. We'll talk about different drugs that can affect uh, preload a little bit later on. Okay. So um, again, uh, the two main delineations here between calcium channel blockers we're going to have are going to be the non-dihydropyridines or DHPs, and then you'll have the dihydropyridines, or DHPs, okay? Those are two big delineations. You're going to find that the non-DHPs, there's two drugs in that category we'll talk about, are going to mainly affect the heart and the blood vessels, okay? This is going to decrease that heart rate, decrease that contractility, and decrease blood pressure, right? Because they're going to affect the vessels as well. The dihydropyridines, the DHPs, those are going to preferentially work on the vessels. These have uh, relatively little effect on the heart. Okay, that's a big delineation here. So again, if I had a patient who had a rapid heart rate, you would not want to give them a DHP because it really wouldn't have any effect on that on the heart specifically. Okay, that's a big delineation here. We'll look at the different uh, effects we're going to see in just a few minutes. So therapeutic uses, what are we going to use these drugs for? We can use it for angina, right? What is angina? Chest pain, doo doo. Ischemia, we're not delivering enough oxygen to the heart. We'll talk more about that later. We have a little section on that. Uh, hypertension, we can use this for supraventricular arrhythmias, meaning those that are originating above the ventricles, right? Um, and again, that's going to be specifically the non dihydropyridines we'll talk about later. Um, you can use this for heart failure. You can use this for cerebral ischemia. We use this for migraine prophylaxis. A lot of uses for these drugs, which is why it's important to cover them here because you're going to see them come up again and again as you're working uh, clinically. So here's the three, uh, sort of, uh, here's kind of the, the breakdown here. So we're going to have uh, the non-dihydropyridines are going to include diltiazem and verapamil, okay? These are going to be good for causing vasodilation. They're going to be good for decreasing cardiac contractility. They're good for suppressing automaticity of the SA and the AV node. Again, don't memorize if it's four or five pluses. Just know that it's good for doing all of these things here, okay? These are good across the board for affecting the heart and the blood vessels, right? I'm sorry? Those are the two non-dihydropyridines. Again, I'll give you the list of the dihydropyridines in a minute here. But again, that's why there's only two drugs in the, in the non-DHP category. But think about them working kind of uh, very similarly to one another. Okay? The dihydropyridines are really only going to have effects on the blood vessels, but not a whole lot of effect on the, on the actual automaticity of the heart, not a lot of effects on contractility. So if you had a patient that just had hypertension, dihydropyridines might be a better option for that patient. Now, one thing to consider, what happens if I were to, say, dilate the blood vessels and you get very hypotensive? What do you think the heart wants to do to respond to that? Tachycardia, right? So, again, if I had TPR goes down, cardiac output has to go up to compensate for that, right, to keep the, the perfusion uh, regulated. So, one of the things you may actually see with these dihydropyridines is that when you decrease the blood pressure too much, you can actually see tachycardia along with that. And, in fact, this is what I do sometimes. So, say, for instance, I have a patient who overdosed on unknown medications, but I know they had heart medications on board, so they had all kinds of different heart meds at home. I don't know what they took. Oftentimes, I can look at their vitals and give me a clue, right? So, again, if they're bradycardic, hypotensive, that may lead me down one road versus their bradycardic, I'm sorry, tachycardic and hypotensive. Okay, maybe it's something else instead, right? So, again, these are little clues you can look at and say, okay, what's going on here, right? So, again, think about these physiologic effects and what they're going to have on our patients here.
So getting into, uh, we'll talk about deltaism of Rapamil. You kind of think about these very similar to one another. Um, now these are available PO, IV. A lot of times these are given as like a sustained release sort of formulation. So again, you have to give them less frequently. You don't have to memorize those facts specifically. But um, you know, if you work like in emergency medicine or like in the ICU or something, you're probably going to use a lot of deltaism or Verapamil IV. We use these a lot for uh, supraventricular arrhythmia. So I'm sure you've used it like you know uh, SVT unresponsive to adenosine or something or you know AFib or things like that. Uh, very good drugs for that because again, decreasing heart rate, decrease in contractility, okay? Um, again, we can use this for anginome. We can use this for hypertension, uh, supraventricular tachycardia. These are all really good options uh, uh, for deltaism. And we'll also see this is the case for verapamil as well. Now, looking at the adverse effects, these all make sense based on the mechanism of the drug. So for instance, peripheral vasodilation. Okay, well, they're going to be working on the blood vessels, not only just the, the ones, you know, perfusing, uh, not just the main arteries, but we can see things like flushing, see things like headache, you can see things like hypotension, peripheral edema. A lot of these drugs can worsen peripheral edema, which can be problems with uh, patients who have like peripheral vascular disease and things like that. So you want to be careful with that in those patients. Um, if you have a patient who's already bradycardic or has like, say, an AV block, this is going to worsen that, right? And again, this is going to be specific to verapamil and deltaism. You don't really see this with the dihydropyridines, as we'll see in a few minutes here, okay? Um, now, why do you think it might have so many GI effects? Based on the mechanism, what, what do you think? The GI tract is all what? It's all smooth muscle, right? So, again, it'd be nice if they only affect the vessel, but you tend to see that it has some bleed-over effect, right? It will affect the smooth muscle on the, uh, on the GI tract as well. So, again, if I'm blocking calcium influx, if I'm blocking contraction, what do you think it does to peristalsis? It decreases it, right? So, what can I see with that? Constipation, right? So constipation is a big thing. Imagine if I had a patient who had chronic pain and had hypertension. I put them on verapamil, and they're on oxycodone, an opioid that causes constipation. And you can see how these things start to build up on one another. So uh, that could just be like the normal diarrhea, like just normal like stomach. It's one of those things where it's just like, you know, it's probably more common to see constipation, but, you know, diarrhea may occur as well. It just depends. Uh, it's one of those things that everything kind of gets reported during the clinical studies. But um, constipation, I would think of as being more common in, in that case there. But again, any drug can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, right? But not every one uh, causes constipation. Anywho. Um, other things to know here, again, you can see some CNS effects here. This is typically going to be more in uh, elderly patients who maybe not have a whole lot of hemodynamic reserves, so, you know, dizziness, drowsiness, things like that. Um, notable here as well, this can actually cause a little bit of gynecomastia or sexual dysfunction. Not really sure the mechanism here for that specifically, but you can see that with that. And then some gingival hyperplasia as well. So kind of a unique sort of side effect you're going to see uh, with some of these. The oral health is going to be a really uh, important thing for those patients there to make sure they don't have that gingival hyperplasia kind of take over. Uh, contraindications, you know, if they already have advanced heart block, if they already have hypotension, um, those would be relative contraindications. You probably want to avoid that because you know it's only going to worsen it. And then as far as relative contraindications here, you know, it can worsen things like heart failure. Again, what's the main problem with heart failure, especially left-sided? Decreased contractility, right? Because, again, the, vessel, or the, the ventricle is not really working all that well. This is going to worsen that, right? We said it's a negative inotrope. You don't want to do that. So you can be very careful with these uh, non-dihydropyridines and CHF patients, okay? Um, liver disease can worsen, you know, liver disease potentially, and then GERD we already mentioned because, you know, we talked about the, the GI effects there. Now, one thing to really note here as well is the drug interactions are much more uh, prominent with the non-dihydropyridines, okay? So notice here as well that not only are these going to be substrates for CYP3A4, these are also going to inhibit 3A4. That means it's going to do what the levels of, say, something like simvastatin? going to elevate it, right, because it's the CYP3A4 inhibitor, okay? Uh, that means it's going to be able to increase levels of statins, carbamazepine, propranolol, all the drugs we're going to talk about in the future. Um, again, these are big things to think about. PGP, remember that's that efflux pump that normally spits things back out into the GI tract? If I inhibit that, levels also go up, okay? So again, be very careful with drug interactions when you're giving these drugs to these patients here, okay? Um, and again, think of the pharmacodynamic interactions, right? So if I give something like a negative inotrope, like diltaizem, and I add it onto another negative inotrope, like a beta blocker, those are going to be synergistic, okay? So you got to think about other cardiac meds that are on and make sure you can be careful when you're adding these all together because they can see a lot of synergy there, okay? And it's not uncommon for patients to be two or three or four different of these heart medications like I see over in the cardiac unit we have uh, at Nemours. You know, we have a patient who's on amiodarone, which we'll learn about later, on, on digoxin, they'll be on, um, uh, you know, verapamil. They'll be on a litany of different drugs and you have to be really, really careful because, again, if you tip the scale one way, too far, you're going to find they can get, uh, get into some big trouble there, okay? Um, so just know that this is going to be synergistic with other cardioactive medications. Yes, ma'am. So, and I know you said that they're going to do that anyways, but they don't, they don't 
technically you don't want to mix like two negative ions here mm -hmm. together. Typically. That will just blow the heart rate down. Yeah, it's, it's going to be more synergistic, right? So. Yeah, if it had to happen, then you adjust your doses, right? You, you try to start low dose on, on or maybe cut the dose of one as you start the other one at low dose to see how they respond to it. And it's all about seeing how your patient responds to it because we like to think that, you know, every person's kind of unique in their own ways, right? So, again, most patients are the same, but everyone's unique, right? Um, kind of goes both ways. So you're going to find that some patients respond a little bit better one way versus another, and you'll get you know, a feel for that as you treat many of these patients, right? Doesn't digoxin increase this complexity? So why does the digoxin? Yeah, so you may find um, that uh, may not necessarily be the contractility, but maybe more the the heart rate. So maybe do the negative chronotropy. Uh, you can see with uh, digoxin. Digoxin is kind of a weird one. We'll talk about it a little bit later on. Um, kind of an interesting one. But again, other drugs that inhibit CYP three or four can also affect diltiazem, right? So again, not only is it an inhibitor, but it's also a substrate of that enzyme. So other drugs can affect it as well. Okay. Okay. Now, verapamil, you can kind of think about it the same way. The same indications, same routes we have available. We do this one IV as well. A lot of times it depends well, you know, which one you have on formulary, which one you have available to you, as which one you're going to end up using. The dosing is a little different between the two, but they work very similar to one another. Um, same side effects you're going to see with this, same peripheral vasodilation, same GI effects. Everything's going to be very similar here. So, again, you kind of think about these two kind of together. Again, same contraindications. You know, the same effects. This is also going to be a CYP3-4 inhibitor. So again, you can't get around that. If you um, have to have one of these on board, you got to watch for the drug interactions here, right? Um, you know, I just had a patient recently who was on an antifungal that was increasing uh, or was blocking CYP3-4, then I had to put them on verapamil for their heart rate. You know, so again, it gets very sticky when you're trying to mix all these med medications together to see how they respond. But sometimes you have to you have to put these drugs together. You know, you just can't get away uh, any way around it. So um, just be very careful. Make sure you're checking those drug interaction reports, okay? Or if you don't want to check them, call the pharmacist. Get them to check them for you, right? Or do something to work, on, work with your healthcare team. Again, uh, same thing here. If you have another CYP3-4 inhibitor on board, that's going to affect the meal as well, okay? Okay, so those are the non-dihydropyridines. Remember, non-dihydropyridine, think effects on the heart, think effects on the vessels. Dihydropyridines, think just effects on the vessels, Okay, maybe a reflux tachycardia, but mainly hypotension is the main thing you're going to see here. This is where you have things like amlodipine. Most people probably heard like Norvasc before. You have things like nifedipine, nicardipine. Nicardipine is actually the uh, one we have IV that we use quite frequently as an IV calcium channel blocker, dihydropyridine. Um, we have other things that have kind of more um, unique indications. So, for instance, we have one called nimodipine uh, that we actually use for intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Uh, we can actually use this to prevent cerebral vasospasm. So, sometimes we use that like stroke patients and whatnot. Um, and again, um, be careful with these because uh, we typically like to avoid short-acting formulations because they can have pretty drastic effects on dropping the blood pressure kind of too quickly. So we like to use nice long-acting ones, things with long half-lives and things like that. So you don't have really kind of big rebound effects on the pressure going up and down and up and down, right? So again, um, just know that these are not uh, inhibitors of CYP3A4, but they are substrates. So if I had uh, something else inhibiting CYP3A4 and coming on board, this would affect that, right? Or say I had an inducer come on board. Say, remember we talked about rifampin briefly. We talked about endocarditis. Like, remember, that can induce CYP3A4. There's actually drop levels of something like amlodipine. Okay? So be careful of those interactions. There, it kind of cuts both ways. Um, and again, don't worry too much about the half-life. Again, some of them are going to be very long-acting, some short-acting. Um, but, you know, for the most part, uh, we will use a lot of the long-acting ones more commonly. Um, so with this one, the peripheral vasodilation tends to be worse with these than the non dihydropyridines because, again, they're just really affecting the vessels much more predominantly. So you see a lot of uh, peripheral edema. You can see some um, kind of uh, rebound kind of pulmonary congestion from this. You can see dyspnea, wheezing uh, due to this, and then that rebound tachycardia I mentioned, mainly due to the de decrease in afterload. You can see that reflex uh, increase in heart rate due to that. Okay. Now, how could I, how could I blunt that? How do you think? Um, not necessarily a vasoconstrictor, but uh, maybe do something for the heart rate, right? So potentially I can give something like a beta blocker, as we'll talk about later on, or something that's a negative chronotrope, and those can then balance out. So again, when you're thinking about combinations of drugs, as we'll think about later on, you'll see that you want to use a very rational approach here to make sure you're not going to be uh, tipping the scale one way or the other too far. Why is it called dysmetria? I have no idea. I wish I knew. Yeah, it could be due to something with uh, either an androgen release or maybe it has some minor, you know, androgenic, um, you know, Antagonism, uh, we just know it does. Is it a major side effect of not dihydropyridine? 
Um, it would be something to note, but it wouldn't necessarily stop me from using it like in a male patient, you know. Um, and again, it's like it's one of those things I think it gets blown out of proportion more so than, than anything else. So, um, yeah, especially with like spironolactone, like a lot of people think, oh, gynecomastia, gynecomastia. Well, like, uh, pluralinone is like way more expensive, even though it's less likely to do that. I'd rather just start with spironolactone and see how they respond to it. A lot of these patients, they tend to be overweight anyway. They might have some gynecomastia to begin with. So, like, who knows? Like, are we going to worsen it? Maybe not. Like, it just depends. <laughs> I mean, the patient, like, you know, if they can't really tell the difference, like, maybe it's not a big deal, right? So it all depends on the patient. Very uh, specific. I, I just, just stay like it is, right? So um, there's just things to think about, right? Okay. Um, now, again, be careful. We have severe aortic stenosis that can end up dropping your pressure too significantly. Again, if you can't get enough pressure coming out of the aorta, right, and you're dialing all those vessels, guess what? You're not going to be perfusing very well. Though. So be very careful with aortic stenosis. Um, and then uh, patients with you know, unstable angina or recent MI, you want to be careful with those as well because, again, if you drop that pressure, sometimes you can decrease perfusion to the heart, and that can be problematic, right? It can increase uh, ischemia there. So, um, and again, the big thing here, because they don't inhibit cyp 3 4 they're just going to see more pharmacodynamic interactions from these. So if you add it onto other heart active drugs like amiodarone, digoxin, beta blockers, we'll talk all about these in the future, but just know these are all going to be synergistic here. Is, uh, you know, if they decrease blood pressure, guess what? It's going to do it additionally when you add on these other drugs that may decrease pressure. And then cyp 3 4 inhibitors may affect this drug. Inducers may affect these as well. They're substrates, but they're not inhibitors. Sure, like which which point? Uh substrate just means that it's gonna be a uh, uh, a it's gonna interact with CYP three four, right? So not interact necessarily to inhibit or induce it, but it gets metabolized by it. Uh, so when I say a substrate it just means it's a target for that enzyme, right? So again, CYP three four has a lot of substrates because again it metabolizes half of the drugs out there, but um, it, it can be a substrate, mm -hmm. it can be an inhibitor, it can be an inducer, sometimes two. Of the three, um, but again, this in this case it's a substrate, but it's not an inhibitor. So it, gets right? it just gets metabolized by CYP3A4. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. The slide before this one, what was significant about those two? Um, those are just examples, right? So just saying any of these cardioactive meds can cause synergism here. So again, if you have something like a beta blocker that drops blood pressure, and I add on a dihydropyridine, that'll also draw the pressure even further, right? So again, uh, when you're looking at adding, and that could be a good thing, right? So again, if your patient is not being managed well with just uh, amlodipine. I can add on a beta blocker, maybe get some synergies in there, but it could also lead to toxicity if you take it too far, right? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. so that's it for the calcium channel blockers. Now let's move on to the beta blockers, another big class of drugs you're going to get, uh, you're going to see using for multiple duties here, right? So we're going to see used for a lot of different uh, uh, indications. So what do beta blockers do? Blocks the beta receptors, right? So again, what are the main beta receptors we deal with? Beta 1, beta 2. Where do beta 1 primarily reside? In the heart, right? You got one heart. Beta 2, you think of? And the lungs, you got two lungs, right? That's uh, how I learned it. Yeah, so yeah, you beta 1, one heart, beta 2, you got two lungs. Okay. Um, most people have two lungs, I guess. Not everyone, but <laughs> some people don't have a heart. Some people say, I don't have a heart, so I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, so the big thing here is you're going to find that by blocking the beta receptors, you're blocking the effects of what chemicals? Catecholamines, right? Like? norepinephrine and epinephrine, right? So again, these are blocking endogenous catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? Normally, what does epinephrine and norepi do to the heart rate? Increases it, right? Good, okay. What does it do typically to the contractility of the heart? It's gonna increase it, right? So that's a positive chronotrope and a positive inotrope, okay? What does it do to the blood vessels typically? Now, normally, again, so think about the alpha and the beta effects differently, right? So, again, think about um, the alpha effects. You're right, absolute cause vasoconstriction. That's the primary thing you would see if I, say, inject a patient with epinephrine, pressure is going to go up, right? However, there's also beta-2 receptors on the vessels, okay? And, again, think about beta-2 in the lungs, right? They cause bronchodilation, smooth muscle relaxation. They do the same thing on the vessels. So it's a little bit of vasodilation with the beta-2 receptors there as well, okay? That will be important for some minor effects later on we'll talk about. But the main thing is when you blot those beta receptors, you know, decrease heart rate, we can decrease contractility. We think this is going to do to blood pressure. Decrease. Ultimately, decrease it. Okay. So I'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes. So we'll look at it. It may not seem intuitive, but we'll make sense of it in just a few minutes here, right? Because again, you would think the compensatory mechanism would be what? To increase pressure to decrease to, to compensate for that decrease in cardiac output. But just wait. We'll, just, we'll look at some reasons why. No, I'm sorry. So getting, getting to the beta blockers now. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, sorry. So moving on to the beta blockers, right? So again, you expect a beta blocker to be a negative chronotrope, yeah. a negative inotrope, and we'll ultimately see that it's going to be dropping TPR, right? Dropping our blood pressure. Okay. 
So anyway, so looking at this, if we are going to be blocking the beta-1 receptors, so again, you'd expect to see decreased cardiac output, as I mentioned, and acute reflux uh, increase in TPR, right? So again, that seems counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense for using as the antihypertensive sort of drug here. And in fact, it actually decreases exercise tolerance. Why do you think that is? So imagine I need to run a mile, right? Mm -hmm. So you put a gun to my head and say, you got 10 minutes to run this mile. I'm going to say, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> so you got 10 minutes. Like, All right, I got to go, right? But I have a beta blocker on board, right? So naturally, if I need to run really fast, I got a gun to my head. What does my body want to do? Increase sympathetic nervous system activity, increase epinephrine release. If I'm blocking all those receptors up, guess what? The body needs to increase cardiac output to get that blood flowing all through the muscles, but they can't do that because the beta receptor is being blocked here. So for healthy individuals normally, you'll find this actually impairs exercise tolerance. We'll find later on when we talk about CHF, this actually improves exercise tolerance for CHF patients. We'll find out why that is a little bit later on, but just think about that normally, this would impair exercise tolerance. So Like us, yeah, so I gave you guys. Exercise tolerance or even for hypertension. Um, either one, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and again, I don't want to imply anything about anyone's health here. I have no idea what your health history is. Okay. Uh, but I'm just saying, if I assume you guys are mostly healthy, most of you would have an impaired exercise tolerance. You would not be able to run that mile quite as quickly as if, just like you know, I go to a high altitude environment, less oxygen getting delivered to the muscles. Guess what? I'm not going to run that mile quite as fast. Okay. Anyway, so those are the big things you're going to find. The other big thing you see, and this is why this is more important as an antihypertensive effect, is you're going to find this actually will block renin release. Okay. So by decreasing that release of renin by blocking beta 1 receptors, you're also going to block angiotensin 2 production. That makes sense? Less renin, less angiotensin II, less vasoconstriction. So overall, you're going to find that in the long term, you're going to find this is actually decreasing TPR, which is good from that standpoint. Okay. Now, what would happen if I blocked the beta-2 receptors? Why is that a problem? Uh, yeah, I may have a harder time bronchodilating, which is why this is a problem if you have patients who have uh, reactive airway disease, they have asthma. Uh, if I block up those receptors, then I may not be able to bronchodilate as well, right? Or, for instance, if I were to give them a medication, like what's our main bronchodilator? And albuterol. If I give them albuterol, I'm blocking up those receptors. Guess what? It may not work as effectively. Okay, so maybe able to induce an asthma attack, maybe preventing my drugs from working as well. So that's one thing to consider there. So those are big things to, to think about. Beta effects you're going to block those receptors. Also, you're going to find you're blocking some norepinephrine release. That should decrease TPR, decrease contractility, things like that. Um, then also you can find that if some of these beta blockers get into the CNS, you can actually find this will cause things like um, depression. You can actually worsen the, the effects of depression there. And also you can sometimes see things like migraine headaches can be worsened here. Again, ironically, these can actually be used to help prevent migraines from occurring, but acutely they can actually cause migraines. Again, all these drugs are double-edged swords here, right? So again, I'm going to give you something to prevent migraines, but guess what? It'll, it might give you a migraine, okay? Um, yes, ma'am. How long does it take for you to take that medicine so that effect goes away? Um, it depends. Uh, again, it's one of those things where you're getting to start low dose and titrate okay. up. You don't want to, like, hammer them with a big dose all of a sudden because, yeah, they're definitely going to be a big bounding uh, migraine there. Um, and then also altering the baroreceptor reflex. When I, what do I, uh, when I say baroreflex uh, response, what do you think that means? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, with these chronically hypertensive patients, like normally, like you know, for most of you, I hope, um, your normal blood pressure should be sitting around 120 over 80, right? So, again, that's your normal baroreceptor response. They just think, okay, that's normal for us. But then chronically, you're going to find over time that maybe 160 over 100 is kind of normal for that patient now. That has now reset that reflex to say, okay, this is my new normal, okay? Now, what would happen if I gave that patient an antihypertensive? That could be, yeah, you could definitely see that. But again, when you start to drop that pressure, the baroreceptors say, wait a second, not enough pressure here. Let's go ahead and bump it back up, right? Let's increase sympathetic outflow. Let's go increase ADH. Let's do all those things that, that would normally affect. So this can help over the long term, kind of resetting the baroreceptor reflex to try to get that back down to normal, okay? So that's one of the other effects you're going to see with this. So again, um, yeah, acutely, you could see that you may have uh, issues like that. We may not have, uh, you may have a hemodynamic insufficiency, but long term, you can hopefully reset those responses, okay? So um, looking at the differences in beta blockers, right? So again, selectivity is going to be a big role to play here. When I say selectivity, what do you think that means? Yeah, which receptors is it going to primarily hit? So we're going to talk about non-selective beta blockers affecting beta 1 and beta 2 equally. And we're going to talk about cardioselective beta blockers, which means they primarily affect beta 1. Okay, those are the big things there. So for an asthmatic patient who's really respond or needs that beta 2 effect, which ones am I going to give them? 
cardio selective, right? I want to selectively affect the heart versus leaving the, uh, the lungs alone. Okay, so kind of think about it that way. Um, that's one of the big differences. That would probably be the primary thing you're going to be thinking about when you're deciding between cardio selective versus non selective. Okay, um, some effects uh, you may decide, you know, some, some choices based on how it's metabolized. You know, we'll find some of them are going to be more renally eliminated, maybe bad for patients with kidney disease. A lot of them are going to go through the hepatic metabolism, right? And that may uh, affect things if they have, you know, poor hepatic function. Maybe that'll affect how well they're going to be able to metabolize those. Again, not going to harp on that quite so much here, but just know that some of them are going to be more renal, some of them are more hepatic. So, yes, ma'am. Um, so that for, like, just look at the non-selective, like, just look at the non-selective and hepatic. Yeah, it's going to be independent of whether it's selective or not. Yep, yep, for sure. And then um, we're going to find there's also a third generation sort of set of beta blockers here. And they actually have some kind of ancillary effects, things that are not directly related to beta blockade. And this includes things like nitric oxide production. Okay, we haven't covered nitrates yet, but nitric oxide typically does what to the vessels? Dilates them, right? Good. Okay, so that does that. Alpha 1 antagonism, what do you think that would do? Antagonizing alpha 1 would dilate the vessel. That's good too, right? That helps with our blood pressure. Uh, beta 2 agonists, what does that do to the blood vessels? That would dilate them as well. Okay, that's good. All right, so we're going to see that some of them are going to have varying effects here, and we're going to look at those. Some of them can block potassium channels. That's going to be really important as an antiarrhythmic, as we'll see a little bit later on. So just know that they're going to have a little bit different activities here, and we'll talk about those third generations and what those are in a moment. So the non-selective beta blockers, and again, this is my mnemonic, how I remember these may uh, may get, you know, your mileage may vary, I should say. So what I think about when I think non-selective beta blockers, I think the letters N, as in Nancy, through Z are going to be non-selective. So propranolol, natalol, pembutalol are going to be my non-selective beta blockers, okay? Now, one thing to note here is the lipid solubility. If it has a high lipid solubility, where do you think it likes to go? Into the, well, into the tissues. Where else? Where can it cross? The blood-brain barrier. You're more likely to see CNS effects. And this actually makes sense a little bit. So if I give propranolol to an elderly patient, guess what? And all of a sudden, they, you know, their dementia starts to get worse. Maybe they start sundowning. You guys know what sundowning is? What is that? I'm going to describe it. Exactly. Especially like when they're in the hospital or like an un unfamiliar setting, the sun starts to go down and they get weird. Like they get start to get a little, a little wacky. And and you know, it, it can be it can be very um, detrimental like to the family, especially when they're like, Man, like grandpa's just not acting the right anymore. Um, you know, my grandpa went through it too when he got had his heart attacks and went to the hospital. He would just get super whacked out whenever the sun went down. Um, they couldn't tell if it's because like, you know, is his Alzheimer's getting worse or is it due to whatever? Um, but sometimes it's drugs, right? Sometimes the drugs can be playing a role here as well. And so lipid soluble beta blockers tend to worsen uh, or can cause ultra mental status, cause uh, nightmares and things like that in these elderly patients. Okay, it's one thing to think about. However, that lipid solubility is also going to make it really good for another effect we'll talk about in just a few minutes here. Anyway, um, keep in mind the soda law. This is actually going to be a, a unique one that we'll talk about in the antiarrhythmic section. So this one is not going to be used very frequently as like an antihypertensive, uh, but used more as an antiarrhythmic. So just kind of note that, and we'll talk about that one later. Okay, the beta one selective agents, the cardio selective agents. I think about A through M. Now, this is not a perfect mnemonic because we're going to see the third generation ones will violate this. So you have to just kind of learn which ones are the third generation. And it kind of stinks, but you just have to know those. Um, but things like acebutalol, atenolol, um, metoprolol. Metoprolol is probably a very common one you're going to see. That one's good because it has um, IV forms and, and PO forms available as well. I really like esmolol from the IV standpoint, from the an emergency medicine sort of standpoint. This one's nice. Uh, it's called Brevablock. What do you think that, that Breva name sort of means about it? Very short acting, so we actually have to give it via continuous infusion. It's really nice because you can titrate it up and down. The beta, you know, if the heart rate gets too low, titrate it down. Heart rate gets up too high, titrate it up. And you, just, you know, heart rate gets way too low, blood pressure bottoms out, just stop it. It goes away in a few minutes. I like it from that standpoint, from uh, from an ER standpoint. But um, yeah, these are the main ones you're going to be seeing uh, used here. If you see RE or HN, that just means either renal elimination or hepatic metabolism. Don't really memorize those facts so much now. Just know that there's going to be some differences there, right? Uh, okay, here's the third generation agents. And so here we have these other actions we kind of note here. So again, things like cardiolol. Again, where do we see this being used? So glaucoma, if you remember back, right? So you can look and see there, right? Um, things like carvedilol is a very common one. It's called Coreg. You're going to see it very frequently. Notice it has alpha-1 blockade, has some antioxidant, anti-proliferative effects. Very good for CHF patients. We're going to see this is actually one of the preferred beta blockers for CHF. Um, Labetalol is a really good one. This has some uh, some IV formulations available. Huh? Pregnancy. Oh, yeah, pregnancy. Yeah, Labetalol is going to be one of the preferred ones for pregnancy, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but, again, that's one really good one for kind of acute blood pressure management, IV-wise. And then something like Bataxolol, which is another ocular one we talked about already. 
So um, what are we going to use beta blockers for? Hypertension is a big indication here. Oftentimes, though, this is going to be used as an add-on agent. We don't typically use beta blockers as a first-line agent. They're not really as effective as other things like an ACE inhibitor or maybe a hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothaladone, something like that. Um, but it's good if you have a patient who is um, uh, on one agent. It's not really kind of getting them right within range, you can add on something else, right? So you know, beta blocker is a good second line sort of add on sort of agent here. And this is good for patients who maybe have a high renin state, because when that decreases renin release, if they have a resting tachycardia, increased catecholamines, maybe they're like a little hyperthyroid or something like that, this could be a good agent for them in those cases there, right? However, remember in the young patients, exercise intolerance is going to be a problem, right? So again, just note that depending on the dose and then you know, depending on how active they are, you know, if it's an elite athlete or something, you know, they're probably not going to tolerate this very well versus someone who's normally couch potato, eh, maybe they won't even notice, right? It just depends. But again, can still be useful in the elderly patients. You just have to think about things like, you know, how lipid soluble is that drug? Propranolol can be really nasty in using in older patients due to the altered mental status you can see with that. Okay, so be careful with that one. So um, again, the mechanism here is going to be decreasing cardiac output. It's going to be decreasing angiotensin II formation, decreasing norepinephrine release. All these things are good, but ultimately it's that altered baroreceptor reflex is ultimately going to be the long-lasting effect you see with management of hypertension. Okay. Okay. Other things, we talked about glaucoma, so I'm not going to belabor those points, but it helps to decrease production of aqueous humor. Uh, migraine prophylaxis this helps to kind of regulate cerebral blood flow to a point. We don't have the full mechanism, um, but just know occasionally we'll use that. We'll talk about that more in the neurology section next semester, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Hyperthyroidism. This one's kind of interesting because um, with hyperthyroidism and specifically things like thyrotoxicosis and thyroid storm, you know, patients have a lot of T3, a lot of T4 floating around. You have to know which, um, which thyroid hormone is more, uh, more active, T3 or T4. T3. T3 is a much more active form. Um, but however, which one's more predominant floating around the bloodstream? T4, right? So this is actually kind of interesting. If you have someone who's in a thyroid toxic, uh, thyroid toxic sort of state or thyroid storm, you can give something like um, uh, propranolol and it helps to decrease the heart rate, gets the blood pressure down, but also prevents a conversion of T4 over to T3. It's kind of an ancillary sort of benefit there. So you may see propranolol being used for a thyroid storm for some patients. Okay. Okay, other indications, Ang uh, angina, uh, not angina, angina. I remember the first class I ever taught, um, uh, I said angina, and some of the students were like, um, I think it's angina. I was like, well, I mean, you know, tomato, tomato, whatever. They're like, only you and the cardiology person says angina. I said, well, wouldn't you listen to the cardiology person? <laughs> Just like uh, tinnitus and tinnitus, like I lived next door to an audiologist uh, for a short period of time. I said, what do you say? He goes, tinnitus. And I said, okay, I'm going to say tinnitus from now on. So always follow your experts is what I say. Um, anyway, so the angina, why do you think a beta blocker could work for angina? We said angina is basically decreasing O2, um, uh, decreased O2 supply to the heart, right? It decreases the heart rate, so it uh, increases your diastole, and diastole is when your blood is supplied to your heart. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that could be one portion of it. Also, what does it do overall to oxygen demand by the heart? It decreases, right? So if I decrease heart rate, decrease contractility, the actual oxygen demand of the heart goes down as well, right? So kind of two actual components there, which is, is a good thing, right? Um, also, you know, as I mentioned, you know, decrease, you know, uh, longer time to ask, so you can also help as well, kind of perfuse those, uh, those coronary vessels additionally. But, um, and actually, this is one of those cases where you can actually prolong the exercise time. So if you have someone who, uh, maybe if I can't walk from here to the end of those tables without developing angina, sometimes by giving a beta blocker, which kind of slows down the heart and kind of prevents that O2 demand from going up too high, maybe I can go to the tables and back before I start to develop symptoms, right? Or I can maybe walk out to my car or something like that. So in those cases, in young patients, you may see decreased exercise tolerance. In patients who have issues with angina, you may see HF, maybe you can actually increase exercise tolerance, okay? One of those things to kind of uh, think about. Uh, we use these quite frequently in myocardial infarction. So again, if you have someone who has an MI, beta blockers are shown to decrease mortality. Now, again, take that with a grain of salt because, again, if your patient's coming in and they're hypotensive, bradycardic, I probably don't want to give them a beta blocker. This is going to worsen it, right? However, when they get stabilized, right, then you want to go ahead and give it to them. But if they come in, they're hypertensive, tachycardic, having this MI, yeah, give them a beta blocker, right? We know it's going to decrease mortality. And most patients who are leaving the hospital should be on a beta blocker, okay? Most patients who are in, uh, with CHF, they should be on a sort of beta blocker, which we'll talk about later in more detail here. But that's uh, shown to decrease mortality, improve survival time, okay? And then also we could use this for supraventricular arrhythmias because we know it's going to work on the nodal tissue. Uh, just like verapamil to tie them with, this could also be used potentially uh, for the supraventricular arrhythmias. Make sense? You know, slowing down that nodal conduction there. Good. Okay. Um, now acute panic attacks, right? Anyone ever heard of like someone taking uh, propranolol for uh, stage fright or for performance anxiety or something like that, right? That's when I was younger. I used to know a doctor who would give up, give up their 
Yep. Yeah, and 100. percent So again, when uh, say for instance, I called on one of you randomly to come up here and give the rest of my lecture. How would you feel? <laughs> you feel sorry for the class? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, I, I mean, I, I think you guys would do a great job. But you know, what would your heart rate do? Boom, 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 you know, having palpitations like crazy, right? Your blood pressure go what? Go up, right? You're you'd be tremulous, right? You'd be you'd be sweating. You'd be having all this sympathetic nervous system. Your fight or flight response is definitely activated, right? I'm not going to do that to you, but just think about what would occur. Think about when the last time you've been in that situation. I always think about uh, when I was in middle school and I called up a girl to ask her out. Now, I've never been so nerve wracked in my entire life, right? Um, I think about that and I was like, okay, well, what can I do to prevent those symptoms? Well, let's block the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, well, I can have a beta blocker and it blocks the effects on the heart, right? So I can slow down the heart a little bit, right? It can uh, stop that the effects on the skeletal muscles. So I'm not having all that uh, tremors going on there. And so it kind of helps not necessarily deal with the effects uh, of feeling like you're uh, nervous, but it deals with the physical manifestations. So you can look more confident, appear more confident. And the other nice thing as well is it doesn't necessarily cloud, you know, kind of slow down the brain like something like a Xanax would or a benzodiazepine, right? So again, for instance, you know, when I have um, students or someone who gets very, very nervous, like during, you know, physical exams uh, or something like that, where they're uh, having to perform in front of a proctor, um, you know, they can say, well, I can take a Xanax and then they're going to be so fogged up that they may forget portions of the exam, not do very well, right? which is not very used to it. However, if they do something like a beta blocker, they can appear more confident, feel a little bit more confident, go and do their exam, and they're still thinking pretty clear-headedly, right? You know, just like you wouldn't want to do a shot or two before an exam. I wouldn't recommend it. I knew a few people in school that did that, but I would not recommend it. However, beta blockers can be a really good alternative to that, right? So again, that's how we use that for performance anxiety, you know, panic attacks, all those sorts of things, right? Okay. Other things, we will use these drugs, and again, I'll, I'll be uh, done shortly, but um, remember we'll use these also for CHF. Now, again, you would think with CHF, their problem is what? Contractility. Beta blockers do what to contractility? Decrease it, right? So you think, well, that sounds, that sounds oxymoronic. Why would I do that? Well, by decreasing that, uh, that contractility, you're decreasing the wear and tear on the heart over time. And so you can actually find this uh, decreases mortality, okay? It decreases exacerbations. And so you have to start very low and start very slow. Oftentimes, patients are inpatient when we do this because we know that we can throw them into an acute exacerbation. We'll talk more about CHF later, but just know this is one of the big indications for um, uh, CHF. And know, um, when you have an MI, what does that sometimes lead to? CHF, right? So again, you can see how one kind of leads into the other. Beta blockers are needed for both, okay? Started here. Any questions from yesterday? It's been a long time. You've probably thought a lot about. I know you miss me so much in that brief, brief period of time. That's okay. Um, all right, so we were talking about beta blockers. Remember, how do they work? Which ones they block? Depends. depends, right? Depends. Most things in medicine, it depends, right? Uh, which ones block beta 1 selectively? Second generation. Second generation, we kind of think about those as kind of how do you remember those? Um, a, through a through M, right? So yeah, there's a cardioselective, like a tenolol, metoprolol, esmolol. Those are the good ones, right? So there's a cardioselective. Non selective ones, you're going to hit beta 1 and 2. Remember, those are going to be kind of your N through Z, right? And the third generation, you kind of have to re remember those, like carvedilol, labetalol, those have kind of unique little features to them. Now, going into adverse effects, um, we mentioned the bronchoconstriction being an issue, primarily the which ones? The non-selective ones, right? Because, again, we're going to hopefully miss that when you have the cardioselective ones. You shouldn't really see any bronchoconstriction. Now, when I say selectivity for beta-1 versus the non-selective ones, is that going to be an absolute selectivity? No, you're always going to lose some effects there, right? So you can still have a beta-1 selective beta blocker, still have some effects of the beta-2 receptors. A lot of it depends on dose and how susceptible the patient is. Um, so it's not to say that you're going to have no bronchoconstriction, seeing with patients with asthma on a cardioselective beta blocker. It just means you're less likely to see it, okay? Or much less likely to see it, but there's still a chance. Other things, we know this is going to be a negative inotrope, right? Which means what? Decreased contractility. We know it's going to be a negative chronotrope, which means decreased heart rate, right? So both of those are going to happen here, just like we saw with the non dihydropyridines like deltiazem and verapamil. Those are the two non dihydropyridines. All the other ones are dihydropyridines. Those work on the vessels more so, right? Um, so those are the big things to think about, right? And you can definitely see with these AV block, first, second, third degree bradycardia, those are very common side effects you can see with these uh, beta blockers. Um, other things you can actually end up seeing uh, for some patients, so depending on what their issue is, say if you have a type 1 diabetic, you can actually see some hypoglycemia by blocking the beta receptors. You think about your stress response and your fight or flight response, what does your blood sugar normally do? 
normally rises, right? Because again, I need that sugar to provide energy so I can run away from the bear or whatever's stressing me out, right? Farm class, whatever it happens to be. Um, but in this case, if you're blocking those receptors, you may actually inhibit glyco uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. You may not be able to generate uh, as much glucose. So in a type 1 diabetic who doesn't produce their own insulin, you can actually end up seeing some hypoglycemia, right? Type 2 diabetic, where their issue is more of insulin resistance, you can actually find that you actually find uh, an increase in glucose levels, mainly due to the fact that by blocking those receptors, you see decreased amounts of insulin being released. It's kind of the opposite of sort of effect there. The other thing is that this can also mask the signs of hypoglycemia. This is a very important side effect of the beta blockers. So when you get hypoglycemic, what are some of the symptoms you would see with that? Lightheaded, a little shaky, may sweat a little bit. You guys ever been hangry before? It's like when you're hangry, right? You get hypoglycemic, you feel like crap. Those are all sympathetic sort of signs you're seeing with that. And so if I'm blocking the, uh, just like with a panic attack or something, right? So if I'm blocking those receptors with a, with a beta blocker, you're not, you may not see a lot of those. So a patient who has diabetes who is hypoglycemic, they may not know it for as long because they're missing some of those physical manifestations. So because of that, they may need to check their sugars more often. They may uh, need to, um, you know, treat themselves with, you know, kind of emergency glucose, things like that, which we'll talk about in endocrine later on. But just think about this as masking those signs of hypoglycemia. It's sort of a unique sort of side effect of the beta blockers you don't see with a lot of other drugs. Uh, other things, you can see some impaired peripheral circulation. This could be an issue, especially with patients, say, with like Renaud's phenomenon, you know, when they have uh, kind of poor circulation there, especially like with the fingers and whatnot. Um, it's going to worsen peripheral artery disease, so be careful with those patients there. And then another thing to think about is if you're blocking beta receptors chronically, what do those receptors want to do? They want to upregulate, downregulate? They upregulate, right, because you're blocking them constantly. So what happens if I, were to, if I were to take away that beta blocker all of a sudden? I have all these extra beta receptors around now. You can see an increase in response there, right? So you can actually see patients who maybe miss their beta blocker can actually induce an MI because all of a sudden they have this super uh, exaggerated sympathetic response in the heart. You know, heart rate's going to go up, contractility's going to go up, O2 demand by the heart goes up, and if you outstrip the supply of oxygen to the heart, guess what happens? Ischemia, infarction, right? So that can actually happen there. So you have to be really careful with these drugs and slowly taper off uh, over the course of a couple weeks. Um, other things I mentioned with the CNS effects, this is more with the lipid soluble drugs. I always think propranolol is kind of being the poster child for this one because you can see uh, depression, nightmares. I mentioned this is really bad, and especially in elderly patients, especially if they have other reasons for them to be somewhat altered, you know, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Um, it's going to worsen that. And you see some kind of worsen triglycerides as well, kind of the, another thing you'll see with these. Uh, as far as drug interactions, the main thing you're going to find, these are going to be more synergistic, more pharmacodynamic sort of interactions. So, for instance, if I were to put this on board with a non-dihydropyridine, which is also going to be a negative inotrope, negative chronotrope, EF is going to go down. Cardiac output is going to be going down. This is not good for those patients. So, very often, you do not combine a beta blocker with a non-dihydropyridine. You can frequently see a beta blocker with a dihydropyridine. That makes sense though, right? Because again, those can get, I can get some synergies in there as far as getting the blood pressure down, which is a good thing. Um, clonidine, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, very similar activities we'll see, but we'll look at that mechanism a bit later on there, right? Okay, so uh, another group of drugs we'll look at here is gonna be these vascular smooth muscle relaxants and also looking at our alpha blockers, okay? And when I say alpha blockers, what do you think that's gonna do? It should cause some vasodilation, right? So by block, usually alpha-1 is going to cause constriction. Blocking them, you should see some dilation. Now, these are going to be used less frequently for the treatment of hypertension, but you still see them out there, so I want you to at least be somewhat familiar with them. So again, blocking alpha-1, you should see a decrease in TPR. You'll see some vasodilation occur here. Um, however, just like with the dihydropyridines, you see that reflex tachycardia, right? So abrupt decreases in TPR, you're going to see an increase in heart rate to compensate for that by trying to get cardiac output back up. Um, uh, first one we have here is going to be prozosin. And again, if you see the zosin at the end of the name, you kind of think about alpha blockers typically. Um, so this one's going to be blocking alpha one. Um, very frequently, you find that these are not going to be great as antihypertensives by themselves because there's a lot of compensatory mechanisms. Your renin angiotensin system is going to kick up in response to these drugs being around by lowering their blood pressure. So oftentimes these are added on as maybe a second drug or a third drug to someone's antihypertensive medication regimen. Okay, uh, so that's why you frequently use it with beta blockers, use it with diuretics to get some synergies in there. Okay. And the big thing you're going to see with these as far as side effects go, by dropping that TPR, you're going to have a hard time with um, you know, being able to regulate blood flow, especially to the brain. And so orthostatic hypotension is going to be a big deal with this, right? And who can orthostatic hypotension be really bad in? 
elderly, right? And again, they get orthostatic hypotension, they start to get a little lightheaded, they get a little dizzy, guess what? They fall, right? And then they break a hip and then they have a whole host of new problems. So you have to be really careful with this. This is another good one to start at nighttime to see how they're going to kind of respond to it. Um, hopefully they'll be you know, sleeping throughout the night and then, you know, they won't have that uh, as bad orthostatic hypotension. But again, postural dizziness, a lot of headache, drowsiness, lack of energy, that can all be seen with these. Again, not really uh, preferable from a side effect profile. So again, these are not first line agents here. As I mentioned, you get kind of a mild reflex tachycardia. We've already kind of gone over why that occurs here. Um, but again, there's a lot of rebound effects here, like increased renin, you know, increased sodium and salt uh, and water reabsorption there. So because of that, these are not great. You need to add them onto other drugs like a diuretic or something. Um, another thing to note here as well is anytime you're dealing with vasodilators or uh, affecting things like alpha receptors, you typically can see impotence as another side effect. Okay. So again, could be a problem, especially in your older gentleman who may already have erectile dysfunction to begin with. You may worsen this. Okay. Uh, other things you may find, you know, other uh, cardiovascular drugs can enhance the effects here. So like a beta blocker could worsen the postural hypotension. Um, you know, uh, NSAIDs can actually uh, lessen the response, just like we saw how NSAIDs kind of affect other antihypertensives by affecting the kidneys. Um, so again, just be careful of patients with cardiac renal failure. This can be um, not a great drug for those patients. Now, a couple other ones you're going to find that kind of fit the same bill here. They work just like prozosin. You'll have uh, terazosin and doxazosin. Both of these are going to work very similar, very similar uh, side effect profiles here. Again, um, we use these as antihypertensives, but a lot of times you may actually see these being used for another indication. That's going to be for benign prostatic hyperplasia. What, what is that? Yeah, so basically the, the prostate is too big. It's kind of impinging on the urethra, and so you're going to have issues um, voiding, right? And so this is one of those things where uh, there's a lot of alpha-1 receptors actually on the prostate. And so if you can actually block those, you can cause it to relax itself, and that way it won't impinge upon um, uh, urine outflow. So that's one of the main ways we're going to be actually be treating BPH. We'll talk about this more in the urology section later on. Um, but again, uh, that's where you're going to see these being used probably more often as monotherapy than uh, you will see them being used as just a strict antihypertensive. Uh, one that's actually a little bit more selective specifically for the type of alpha-1 receptors on the prostate is actually one called tamsulosin. It's easy to think about what the drug does because it's called Flomax is the brand name, so I think, you know, for good for urine flow. Um, you know, so this is one is uh, particularly used for BPH, not really used as an antihypertensive because it's so selective for a particular type of um, alpha-1 receptor, alpha-1A there. Um, and the nice thing there is very limited effects on the vasculature, so you don't really see a lot of hypotension is seen with it. You don't really see a whole lot of, um, um, you know, impotence seen with it. So again, it's nice you can have a little bit more selectivity for a very specific sort of use case there. Okay. Um, the next group here, we have our central sympatholytics. When I say sympatholytic, what do you think? What do you think that means? Decreases the sympathetic nervous system outflow, right? So again, these are going to be centrally working drugs that are going to be decreasing the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. So what do you think it does to heart rate? It's going to decrease it. What do you think it does to blood pressure? going to decrease it, right? Good. So these are going to be kind of similar when you're thinking about like beta blockers of reducing heart rate and blood pressure, similar to the non-dihydropyridines and reducing heart rate and blood pressure, right? So again, think about the drug interactions. If I were to put some of these drugs on board with, say, verapamil, you'd ex already expect to know what the side effects are going to be, hypotension, bradycardia, right? So again, these are things to start thinking about. And again, basically what these are doing is by activating um, two different types of receptors. One, uh, the main one is the alpha-2 receptor. So we've already talked a lot about alpha-1 causing a lot of vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 is actually residing on the presynaptic neuron, is one that we call those autoreceptors. And when they get activated, they actually shut down further release of norepinephrine, okay? So again, once they get activated, say, okay, we have enough norepinephrine around here, we don't need to release anymore. So by doing that, by having a drug come in and activating, it is, it is turning down the sympathetic outflow from the brain down. Okay, so that's going to have widespread effects on both the heart, on the vasculature. So these are very potent drugs. Um, yes, sir. That is a typo. I should say presynaptic. I apologize for that. I, again, I'm not going to get so granular on a test to be like, is it presynaptic or postsynaptic, right? But yes, I should strive for accuracy in all things. I apologize. <laughs> However, uh, big thing though is activating alpha two receptors. That you should know. Okay. There's also what we call these imidazoline receptors, and um, uh, they can also lead to similar effects as well. And actually, we've already run into a lot of the drugs that do this already. So if you remember when we talked about an ENT, we talked about things like afferent, right? Remember the oxymetazoline? This does the same thing, but with that drug, you're work, working at much more centrally. And again, what do we, or I'm sorry, much more locally in the nose. Um, but what do we say about selectivity? 
a lot of it goes to dose, right? So in those cases, you actually have uh, some bleed over from just working on alpha-2 to alpha-1 as well. So you can cause vasoconstriction here in the nose when you have a drug like that. But if I were to give something systemically, you end up ultimately seeing vasodilation occur here. So it's one thing to kind of think about as well. So and again, I'm using something like Visine, right? So something like tetrahydrosylin in the eyes, you can see vasoconstriction. If I use it in the nose, you see vasoconstriction. But that's only because it's working very locally, very high doses. You know, very high concentrations relative to if I were to give a drug systemically, as we'll see here in just a moment. Okay, does that make sense? So ultimately, when you give these systemically, you're going to find it's causing vasodilation, not vasoconstriction like you would see for like ENT purposes or uh, opto purposes. Um, again, you're also going to find, what do you think this would do to, say, just overall CNS activity? Should decrease it, right? So again, what do you think the main side effect is going to be? Drowsiness, right? So again, not necessarily drowsiness from a lack of blood flow to the brain necessarily, but just kind of overall just a global depression of the CNS. And so again, this is something we can find um, as a cost, you know, some drowsiness and decreased uh, mental status sort of things there. So it's another thing you'll see with these drugs. So and again, kind of see how, and clonidine is kind of the poster child for this. So you can kind of see how it's going to be working in several areas of the brain. Again, I'm not going to get so specific as to be, is it, the, you know, the nucleus, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, any specific, I'm trying to think like distractors I would put, I'm not going to get so specific. Just know that it's working centrally to decrease that sympathetic outflow here, right? So again, ultimately you're going to see less norepinephrine release on the blood vessels. You're going to see less um, activity on the heart here. So again, decrease in heart rate, decrease in contractility, decrease in TPR, okay? All right. Again, that's exactly what I just said right there. So decrease in cardiac output and decrease in blood pressure. Those are the main things. Um, so again, the advantages here is that these works on kind of anyone, right? So it doesn't really depend, matter if you're kind of a more salt uh, sensitive, sort of hypertensive, it doesn't matter what your race, your gender, age, anything like that. These are going to be really good. In a lot of cases, these actually work as uh, well as monotherapies. This is going to be an alternative if other agents were not going to be uh, effective or, or tolerated well. Um, and again, um, works pretty well uh, in the elderly, so this could be another good option here. You don't see as uh, severe effects on things like, um, you know, orthostatic hypotension and whatnot as you would some of the other drugs here. But generally, you're going to find a lot of drowsiness, sedation. You can see some dry mouth associated with this. Sexual dysfunction is also going to be an issue here because, again, you need that sympathetic outflow in order to regulate things like, you know, having an erection and ejaculation and things like that. So sexual dysfunction is normally seen. Um, and you're also going to find this has a pretty narrow therapeutic index. We don't do drug levels on this necessarily, but you do need to be careful when you're changing your doses of the drugs. And, again, clonidine, which I mentioned is kind of the poster child here, has a very um, a small dosing range. So, you know, going from 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams, very small doses here uh, can cause pretty big effects on your patient. The other thing to see as well is you're going to have that abrupt withdrawal phenomenon similar to the beta blockers is going to be uh, seeing an acute increase in blood pressure when you remove this too quickly. So again, there's another drug you have to taper off of. Okay. So as I mentioned, clonidine is uh, the, the prototypical sort of alpha-2 agonist we have in this uh, group here. Again, this could be used by itself as, as a drug um, you know, for treatment of hypertension. It can be used as an add-on. just depends on the patient, kind of what they're responding to already. Um, again, you may see a little bit of slight increase in, in blood glucose, mainly due to some decrease in insulin release. One thing to note there as well. Um, but the other thing to, to think about is, as well is like things like you know, the dosage forms. Uh, clonidine is really nice because it actually comes as a patch. So I can actually apply that on and maybe change it, say, every seven days, which is good because that allows for, um, especially elderly patients, if you're worried about compliance, they don't have to think about you know, putting a patch on or they don't have to take a pill every single day or, or multiple times a day. So it's kind of a benefit with that. So um, other things you're going to find is, is uh, nice is it helps to decrease ADH secretion, which we know that ADH typically leads to increases in blood pressure. Um, you may see some increase in sodium retention, just like you would see with say, like an alpha blocker. However, um, if you could get this with a diuretic, you can kind of limit this effect. So maybe like a little HCTZ along with this can go a long way to get some extra synergy there for your blood pressure. And uh, some other things we may actually use clonidine for. Um, so one of the things you'll see is uh, if you ever have a patient who's, say, like addicted to, say, opioids or some other sort of um, a medication there, what, what happens when you take away the, those drugs they're addicted to? Yeah, they have withdrawal, right? So again, they get very, um, uh, very agitated. They get very anxious. They're sweating. They're uh, having a lot of diarrhea, vomiting, all these things. A lot of it is sympathetic mediated. And so actually when, when a very unique population we will use clonidine in is going to be uh, uh, neonates, right? So they have what we call neonatal abstinence syndrome. I mentioned there's little babies who moms have uh, been using drugs throughout their pregnancy. Babies come out and guess what? 
And drugs are also addicted to those drugs, just like the mom was. They have a physical dependence there. And again, we're not going to be continuing to give the babies the illicit drugs the mom were using. So we have to do something else to try to prevent those withdrawals symptoms. And we can actually call it for that. It'll help to kind of tamp down that sympathetic response, help them to kind of um, chill out a little bit, hopefully help them to feed a little bit better, help them grow a little bit better. And so that's one case we'll use that a lot in the NICU. So if you ever work in a NICU, you'll see a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, we'll also use this as well, like we use this within uh, epidural uh, space, we actually use it as an analgesic. And so we'll, oftentimes for patients who are coming out of surgery, we'll put them on something like an opioid plus clonidine with an epidural, and actually that pr uh, provides better pain relief. So if you ever see it used as a, uh, either as an epidural or a caudal sort of injection, that's what we're using it for, is for pain relief. So just some other cases you may see it being used. But for our purposes, we're mainly talking about it as an antihypertensive. So Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lidocaine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So these are totally different routes, right? So again, if I was using like a local anesthetic with epinephrine, that's good because that limits um, the the vasoconstricts, limits the the absorption of the lidocaine. Also keeps it all very local. You know, helps keep the the field clear, more clear because it's less bleeding. Um, this is going to actually be like an epidural. Like you actually uh, apply this. Um, you know, through the spinal cord in order to um, provide more kind of local analgesia. So for instance, we do this a lot for if we have like a spinal fusion cases, uh, we have a uh, particular, um, I don't think any other, the spines are the biggest one we do it for, but any kind of uh, major orthopedic surgery or anything in there. Those are the big ones I would say is where you do the most epidurals, but definitely by adding in clonidine, you get some synergistic effects. So you have to use less opioids, which is always a good thing if you can, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll talk about that later on. We get to like a little surgery section and talk about anesthetics and all, all that good stuff. But uh, as I mentioned, withdrawal sy symptoms can be very severe, very severe increase in blood pressure and heart rate when you're removing this. You got to uh, titrate it off. Think about that. Some orthostatic hypotension, but not as severe as something like an alpha blocker like prosocin, um, you know, bradycardia, impotence. All these can be a potential um, uh, side effect as well. Only other one group and uh, other drug in this group that I'll mention here is going to be guanfacine. This is actually kind of um, interesting because uh, one of the other big indications you'll see this, especially from a family practice sort of standpoint, is not necessary for hypertension. But does anyone know what else I could use it for? Hmm? That's actually guafenicin. Ah, so you see how some of these drug names are easy to mix up? This is guanfacine, not guafenicin. I had a hypertensive patient, I'd give them guafenicin, it wouldn't do a whole lot for their blood pressure, would it? Right? And vice versa, if I had someone who had a kind of a hacky. Hacky cough, like, you know, wouldn't want to give them uh, guanfacine. All of a sudden, yeah, I dropped their blood pressure. It wouldn't be good either, right? So, you guys, to show you, like, you know, look alike, sound alike drugs are a big deal, right? You have to be careful with those. Um, no, but actually, another indication you may see clonidine and guanfacine being used for is actually ADHD, right? So, think about ADHD. What's kind of their issue? Hyperactive, they can't concentrate. Well, what if I decrease that sympathetic outflow? If we kind of like chill them out a little bit, uh, sometimes that can help with ADHD symptoms. A lot of times, anyone know what we normally use for ADHD? Kind of like gold standard? And like amphetamines, basically, yeah. So we're, we're, we're getting them hopped up on, on speed, basically, right? And it helps to kind of concentrate the patients. But oftentimes what we'll do is we'll give them uh, an amphetamine in the morning to kind of like kind of get them very focused. But um, to calm them down at nighttime, we'll give them something like clonidine to kind of like chill them out a little bit. And that helps with the evening time symptoms, right? They're going to bed anyway, so it's okay if there's a little bit of sedation associated with that. So again, sometimes you'll see these combos of drugs being used here. So just another case, another kind of a different range of uh, indications for these particular drugs. But... Anyway, um, guanfacine is nice because it has less uh, sedation as seen with it, less uh, withdrawal syndrome, but probably less effective as an antihypertensive, but you will see this used quite frequently for ADHD. We have a ton of kids who are coming in, probably on Adderall in the morning, and they're like on guanfacine at nighttime. So it's a very common combination we'll see with that. Now, again, is it always good to treat the effects of a drug by giving another drug to counteract that? Not ideal, but sometimes, you know, that's going to be the best regimen for those patients there, right? So we'll talk more about that later in the neuro section later on. Um, getting into direct vasodilators. So these are going to be agents that are going to be directly causing arteriolar uh, vasodilation. We'll see a few they are going to be doing working on the venous side as well, so we'll kind of get into those in a minute. But again, these are going to cause very similar effects to the alpha blockers, right? So again, a lot of reflex tachycardia, a lot of orthostatic hypotension. Um, and again, you're going to find that due to the rebound effects, the normal homeostatic mechanisms like the renin and angiotensin system, these are going to be limited in utility here, okay? So again, these are not agents that we use as first line, but we'll add them on, right? So if you're on an ACE inhibitor, having trouble getting into, into the right range for your blood pressure, we'll add on something else, and it could be one out of these categories. So just a few I want to talk about briefly here. I'm going to talk about hydralazine, minoxidil, nitroprusside, and briefly maybe dioxide. Um, 
Again, clinically, we're going to use these uh, for chronic hypertension, typically added on as an add-on drug, not used by itself typically. However, another thing we may do uh, occasionally is for kind of acute blood pressure management. This is where some of our IV medications can come into play here. So if you have a patient who's in-house, you need to give them something quick to drop their blood pressure. This is where some of these drugs come into play here. So I can give IV hydralazine that's going to drop their pressures. I can give them IV nitroprusside or diazoxide to get their pressures down acutely, right? Again, this is not going to be on the long-term treatment of uh, hypertension. It's more for acute, like within the next few hours to days sort of thing here. So again, they don't have a lot of like kind of that reflex mechanism kicking in there. So uh, first one we'll talk about is hydralazine. Um, again, the mechanism is not super clear here. We think it may work with cyclic GMP, if you think back to our intro to farm course all those many months ago, and uh, secondary messenger systems. But we do know it increases nitric oxide production, which typically acts as a vasodilator. Um, may do things like working with renal prostaglandins, may work with some calcium movements, but just know it's a vasodilator, right? It's going to help to get our pressures down. The thing to note with this one, this is kind of a unique point and probably something you might get pimped on when you're in your rotation. So it's good to know this, right? I always like to focus on the pimping points, as I call them. Um, this gets metabolized through what we call acetylation, okay? Some people are going to be fast acetylators. Some people are going to be slow acetylators. You have some people who are in between. If you're a fast acetylator, what do you think happens to the drug levels of that hydralazine? They're going to decrease pretty quickly, right? So what do you think about its therapeutic effect? doesn't stick around for as long, right? So it may not be as effective, okay? So some people, hydrolysis is not going to be very good for because they're fast acetylators and they get rid of it, right, too quickly. Slow acetylators, what do you think happens to them? Levels are going to go up, and what else can go up? Toxicity, absolutely, right? So this is one of the things you're going to see with this is if you have someone who seems to be responding, uh, they appear to be extra sensitive to the effects of hydralazine, it's probably because they're slow acetylators. So you have to take that into account when you're managing those patients there. Yes, ma'am. Um, no, that's hydroxyzine, another good example of a look-alike sound alike. This is a big one, right? And so have you ever seen that tall man lettering? If you ever see a drug name where random bits of it are in capital letters, that's called tall man lettering. That's designed to prevent people from mixing up these two drugs. So for instance, that's a huge one, hydroxyzine and hydralazine, right? So when you see those two, uh, if I have someone who's hypertensive, I give them hydroxyzine, that's a big medication error, right? Not good. If I give someone, well, they're, they can drop their pressure, get hypotensive. Um, you know, well, so if I gave them hydroxyzine and they had high blood pressure, that's going to make, make them, uh, that's going to cause sedation. Um, you know, it can cause maybe tachycardia because it has an anti, uh, muscarinic effect, you know, so it may not be good for that patient. Right. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of that is if I have someone who's got allergies or, you know, has some anxiety and I give them something to drop their pressure, not good either. Right. So again, that's a big one you always want to make, make sure to, to look for. Yeah. Yep. Good example. I know those are great examples because, again, that helps me to illustrate to everyone else. Like, yeah, it's super easy to happen. And even people who have been working for 10 years can still make the same mistakes. Yeah, because the second you get complacent, guess what? You're going to make a mistake. It's really hard to know. There's probably some um, some ethnicities tend to be more so uh, slow acetylators versus fast acetylators, but it's really hard to predict. Um, so you just kind of have to see how they respond to it. But one of the big things you're going to see, and this is the point I wanted to make here, is that if you have someone who has a slow acetylating um, enzyme, set of enzymes, and they come in with a lupus-looking rash or lupus-like symptoms, this is related to hydralazine, right? There's a couple of drugs that do this. So one of one, uh, one is here. Hydralazine is a big one. Another one's called isoniazid. You may see uh, used for TB. And then the other one's called, called procainamide, which we'll talk about later on in the uh, antiarrhythmic section. So, yes, ma'am. Quinidine doesn't cause this particular issue here, but we'll talk about quinidine a little bit later. Uh, different set of effects. But um, yeah, procainamide's the, the big one from that standpoint. So anyway, so what this is doing is basically you're having um, some issue where you're developing sort of an, uh, an, a reaction to it. Again, sort of an autoimmune sort of reaction by having this hydralazine around at high levels. And so you tend to see this is going to be more seen in, in Caucasian patients who tend to be more slow acetylators. These more in women uh, with long-term use in high doses, okay? So again, if you see that lupus syndrome, that, that sort of lupus-like rash that shows up, that kind of butterfly rash, that's a big thing you would think about, right? And if you get a board type question, right? You see patient presents with lupus-like rash and has hypertension. What drug could cause this? Hydralazine is the one you want to jump to, right? So again, this is a good point you want to remember. Just like disulfiram reactions with metronidazole, those are kind of the, the little points you want to think about. But anyway, a lot of flushing, a lot of dizziness seen with this because again, it's acting as a vasodilator. Now again, be careful uh, with patients with coronary artery disease. This can actually worsen flow uh, to the, through the coronary vessels by dropping the pressure too much. Be careful with that. The elderly, um, and they're going to find that with uh, patients with you know, ischemia, you have to be careful because the fact that um, by causing vasodilation, what does that do to cardiac output? 
it's going to increase it, right? And then what does that do to oxygen demand by the heart? It's going to increase it, right? And that can cause worse in ischemia. This is why you got to be careful with these vasodilators in patients who are at risk for developing ischemia, right? Uh, other thing to note, again, anytime you're changing a patient's stool or urine color, you want to let them know about it, this will turn your stool black, right? Anyone know anything else that can turn your stool black? Hmm? Pepto-bismol. Pepto what else? GI bleed, right? So again, that's why you want to let them know that. So that way they're not like, oh, oh no, I have a GI bleed, right? Uh, iron is another big one, right? So people on iron uh, supplements can do that as well. So uh, another one's called minoxidil. Now, anyone know what we normally use minoxidil for? Not pregnancy. That's actually methyl dopa I think you're thinking about. Hair growth, yeah, this is actually Rogaine, right? So this is originally was used as an antihypertensive, but we found it wasn't very good because of a lot of the reflex mechanisms, specifically the renin angiotensin system. So not great as an antihypertensive drug, but it, we did find that when we were giving this drug to patients for hypertension, uh, what, what do we notice? Yeah, this is hypertrichosis, right? And again, it wasn't just with the head, it was kind of everywhere, right? Because again, this was not working systemically as an antihypertensive. So they realized, okay, wait a second, this is interesting. So let's put it on the head and all of a sudden, oh, we got this new hair growth there, right? Probably due to vasodilation, kind of bring more oxygen, more nutrients to the area. Okay, I guess we can see some extra hair growth there. So um, that's where it gets used more frequently. Uh, very, very occasionally you may see this being used as an antihypertensive, but I can tell you it's not commonly. And in fact, one of the uh, most interesting cases I ran into in fellowship was a uh, alcoholic who ran out of is uh, uh, of access to alcohol, basically. So he was running, running through the CVS or Walgreens. He's looking for something that had some alcohol in it, and he looked at the bottle of minoxidil. And oftentimes, if you have a hard time getting drugs into solution, we'll use alcohol to get it uh, and make it more soluble. This stuff had like, you know, 35% by volume alcohol. So he said, oh, this looks really good. I'm going to drink this Rogaine while I'm here at the CVS. Drank a whole bunch of it, and then all of a sudden got profoundly hypotensive. Got very tachycardic, right? Because all these blood vessels were dilating, essentially. And so we had to have him on, I think we're at one point we had him on five different pressors. I think he was on uh, vasopressin, he was on epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and phenylephrine, right? Just to keep his pressures so he would somewhat be perfusing, right? His kidneys were taking a hit. I mean, I, it, it was bad, right? This guy was, you know, two or three days uh, having to be on all these pressors just to keep him alive. Uh, and eventually, you know, got through it and eventually got discharged. You no know, kind of long lasting to quite life. But... Be very careful with minoxidil from that standpoint. I would definitely recommend not drinking it, if anything. <laughs> However, though, if you have this in the house, who might be at risk for drinking it? Kids, right? Kids can always be uh, at risk there. Anyway, so again, you're going to find um, this is a very, very uh, strong vasodilator. You can see a lot of increase in cardiac output. So again, that myocardial ischemia is definitely something to be thinking about. Um, and actually, can actually cause some arrhythmias as well due to affecting some of the potassium channels. We'll see that more when we get to the antiarrhythmic section later. Uh, as I mentioned, the hypertrichosis. So again, if you're giving it systemically, you're going to see it systemically versus if I just rub it on the head, you may see it there. Tried rubbing some around my face area, didn't seem to work too well, so whatever. Um, as I mentioned, Rogaine is typically the, the brand name you're going to see used for, for that. I was talking to my brother. He's got the same facial hair growth pattern as I do, and I uh, said, you know, no, no beard November, or no, no shave November was called, and it says, like, what you think it's going to look like, and this guy was like this big luscious beard, and it's like, what it actually looks like, and it looks, it looks like ours. <laughs> so he said, darn our parents for our beard genes. Anyway. Um, uh, one of the last ones we'll talk about here, it's called nitroprusside. This is actually a really good one to use, especially like in the ICU sort of setting. Very good um, IV vasodilator. We use this quite frequently to help manage uh, blood pressure here. Um, what's interesting about this one, it has one molecule of nitric oxide, which we've already said is a, a vasodilator. We'll see that more with the nitrates later on. And it's five cyanide molecules bound to it. A cyanide, what is that notable for? It's very toxic, right? And, you know, but our, our body is able to handle some degree of cyanide, right? Because it's carbon and nitrogen put together. We produce some cyanide, you know, every day as part of our normal biochemical processes. But um, one of the things you're going to find is that we do have to think about the cyanide toxicity uh, with this drug. So oftentimes what we're going to give it is with another drug called sodium thiosulfate. I'll show you that in a second. But what's nice here has pretty balanced effects on both decreasing um, uh, constriction of both the veins and the arteries, right? So we kind of work on both preload and afterload uh, from that sense there. Very good antihypertensive, and we give it via IV infusion. So that way it's uh, very titratable. You know, depending on if the pressure goes down too low, turn it down. If it goes too high, we'll turn it back up. So very nice from that standpoint. So as I mentioned, with cyanide toxicity, basically it kind of prevents your cells from utilizing oxygen. So you see a lot of metabolic acidosis. You can see seizures associated with this. Very, very bad. So we give it with sodium thiosulfate. Basically it allows the liver to process the cyanide a little bit more effectively there. However, if you have someone who has renal dysfunction, you may actually find you build up the, the byproduct here. And it's called thiocyanate. And you actually see some symptoms from that as well. So be very careful with patients with renal disease, patients with um, hepatic disease. You may not be able to handle nitroprusside so well. Okay. So thiosyanate. 
the yeah, so basically when you give the cyanide plus the th sodium thiosulfate, the liver will turn that into thiocyanate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at how we actually manage blood pressure. So again, we have the JNC8, uh, which is now the current recommendations here. And if you guys talk about blood pressure management already in CMS, okay, so what are the what do they recommend as their first lines? Okay, so a lot of it's going to go back to who, what type of patient do you have, right? So again, what's their race? What are their comorbidities? It's all going to be playing a role here, right? So looking at this, the black population, they tend to respond better. And again, this is with or without diabetes. They respond better to something like a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker, right? So again, this could either be dihydropyridine, non-dihydropyridine. Again, if they have something like, you know, first degree AV block, I probably wouldn't want to do a non-dihydropyridine, right? Maybe something like amlodipine would be a good option. Hmm? Uh, it could do, I wouldn't want to do a non if they already had something like AV block, right? I wouldn't want to do that. So, um, and again, the thiazide diuretic, um, any of them work fine. I think chlorthalidone now has probably the first line preference because has a little bit more evidence to show um, some decreases in mortality. So, chlorthalidone is a, is a big one there. Um, for the non black population, with or without diabetes, they recommend um, either thiazide is fine. You can use a calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, ARB, any of those are fine. Your options are a little bit more wide with that one, okay? However, with uh, chronic kidney disease patients, ARBs or ACEs should be used. Why is that? Nephroprotective, right? Good. How about in diabetic patients? That, that's another thing to consider as well. So I would also consider, you know, with that diabetes, like maybe that would lean me more towards using something like an ACE inhibitor because I do worry about the, the nephroprotective sort of effects with that, right? So anyways, you want to give them at least a month of therapy, see how they respond to it, and then either go back and try to increase your dose but again, remember, a lot of these have kind of a flat dose response curve. So by increasing your dose, you may not see a whole lot of additional effect. That's where we need to add on another drug, right? So again, if you start them on lisinopril, it's not working enough by itself. What do you want to add on next? Your thiazide might be a good option. It's a very common combination. See an ACE inhibitor plus a diuretic. Now, would I want to use a loop diuretic here? Mm. Those are not good for blood pressure management uh, by themselves. Those are good for getting rid of fluid. Thiazides are going to be your go-to, okay? What if I had them on, say, a thiazide, and they came back, and I did some labs, and their potassium was low? What can I put them on? ACE would help to get that potassium back up good. What else could I put them on? Spironolactone or triamterine or milleride. Those are another ones that can help to spare some potassium, right? So these are things you want to consider, right? So again, uh, if I had an uh, asthmatic patient, what could be good for them? Really anything except for non-selective beta blockers, right? So I could say like which one is it would, and again, I don't like to ask not questions. I wouldn't say, you know, which is true except or which of the following, uh, you know, which would not be something. But I may ask which one of these would be contraindicated in this type of patient, right? It's kind of like a not question, but not really, right? Because it's more asking what is the contraindication for this sort of patient here, right? So those are things I might be asking you on, on the test, okay? So you can decide what's a good first-line agent, what's a good second-line agent to add on. You know, so for instance, if I said, you know, patient's on an ACE inhibitor and you're asking what, what drug would you add on next, you know, obviously an ARB would not be a good option there, right? Because they're doing the same thing. You want synergism. You want different mechanisms that are going to be complementary, okay? Those are things you want to kind of think about, okay? A diabetic patient, you know, what's going to be the problem if I put them on a beta blocker, the type 2 diabetic? Hyperglycemia, right? Absolutely. Or it could be masking the signs of hypoglycemia. Maybe that's not a good option for them. Okay. And again, when we get into things like angina and talking about CHF, we're going to see some other competing indications for some of these drugs, and that will also lead you to decide, okay, what am I going to use? So oftentimes you're treating them for other things with some of these antihypertensives, and so this is kind of the other, um, this kind of ancillary effect is, yeah, you get their blood pressure under control, but they needed to be on some of these other drugs anyway. So we'll cover those as we go forward. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So that's it for this section. All right, so moving on, we have section three here. So again, we covered all the antihypertensive drugs, right? So we're going to find that a lot of these drugs are going to be pulling double, triple, quadruple duty here. So we've talked about a lot of these already. We don't have to belabor all these points. What you knew about them from hypertension, guess what? They work the same way here. No problem. So let's talk about angina. What is angina, as we mentioned? Chest pain, right? It's chest pain is a manifestation of what? Ischemia or infarction of the heart, right? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we have ischemic heart disease, which is basically this imbalance between O2 supply and O2 demand, okay? So again, what are things that increase O2 demand? Increase heart rate, increase contractility, right? The workload of the heart is going to increase in the demand here. And what's affecting the supply? 
the vessel, what can actually make it to the, so if you have a blocked off vessel, guess what? You can't deliver oxygen uh, to, to that tissue there. So that's where we see this. And again, so you have uh, basically ischemic heart disease, you have coronary heart disease, which is uh, kind of broken down into, um, you know, ACS, you have your acute coronary syndromes, which can include unstable angina, which what, what do I mean when I say unstable angina? Chest pain at rest, basically, right? So again, normally you have some amount of physical exertion before they develop the chest pain. However, this is just at rest. It's called unstable angina. It's definitely a precipitator to developing an MI, right? Uh, and you have acute MI, which you can break down into what? Non yeah, STEMI and non-STEMI, right? So we'll talk about those briefly. Have you covered this already in your medicine course? Oh. Oh, good. It's on today, so this will be good. Hopefully, some some refresher. Fantastic, right? Um, now, the main thing we'll talk about mostly here is going to be from the more chronic, stable management of, of stable angina, right? So again, these are patients who are going to have some degree of uh, physical activity um, before they actually develop the, those manifestations of ischemia, right? And of course, um, that chest pain, obviously, this is kind of the most common manifestation, but obviously, there are some people who present kind of non-traditionally in a lot of cases. You may find other signs of ischemia that may not just manifest as chest pain, but kind of focus on that. Again, we mentioned it's a, an issue with either demand of oxygen by the heart or on the supply side. So ideally, our drugs are going to work on either one or both of these pathways here. So some are going to increase demand, or sorry, decrease demand. Some are going to work on the supply side. Some are going to do both, as we'll see. As I mentioned, heart rate contractility are typically the two big things that are going to be playing a role here as uh, far as the oxygen demand goes. Also, things like you know, uh, the, the actual wall tension. And the higher the tension there, um, we're going to find this is going to be uh, affecting, you know, basically how hard the heart is going to have to work to pump that blood. And again, this is a function of preload and afterload. So what affects preload? Kind of the blood coming back into the heart, right? So on the venous side of things, that affects preload, right? So for instance, if I, if I had a venodilator and I increase the capacitance of the vessels, guess what that does to preload? Should decrease. Okay, well, maybe that helps decrease the, the workload of the heart, right? Because again, some of these patients are very fluid overload, they have a lot of congestion that increases that, that preload significantly. And then we have the afterload. What is that? This, yeah, it's how how uh, you know how uh, you know small of a diameter that hoses you're trying to pump against, right? So again, the the higher that afterload, the harder the heart has to work to pump against that. Okay, good. So these are all cases here where we can affect both preload and afterload with some of our medications, and that should affect oxygen demand by the heart. So. And again, looking at the vessels here, you can see how um, you know, these, these plaques will develop over time. And eventually, you know, we like to uh, you know, see that you know, we have a lot of reserve. You know, we have a lot of ability to have a lot of flow even when these plaques are developing. But it's when you get to more of these um, cases here where they get very um, you know, much more occlusive, finding much less flow happening here. And then, of course, this can where it can develop into full-on MI. We have lesions breaking off, and they have you know, an embolus occurring there. Again, we're going to talk about ways we can actually manage that from a, a, a coagulation standpoint a little bit later. Um, but again, let's just focus on how we're going to deal with the chest pain symptoms kind of at a baseline. So as I mentioned, um, you know, looking at this, uh, angina can happen with any degree of stenosis. A lot of it has to do with how blocked the actual vessels are, but also how constricted those vessels are, right? And there's actually some cases where people can have angina without really any blockage occurring here. So we'll talk about sort of an atypical sort of angina in just a moment. And that's this moment, exactly. Uh, we have this vasospastic, or what we call this variant angina, where basically this happens in like younger patients who probably don't have like a really strong cardiac history, um, but you can have this uh, things where, you know, um, they have this kind of inappropriate autonomic control that causes uh, vasospasm of the coronary vessels. And actually, in some cases, you may even see ST, uh, ST segment changes associated with this. And actually, the management of this is going to be differing uh, compared to a lot of other cases of, uh, of uh, angina, because in those cases, it's not necessarily the O2 demand by the heart, but it's just the fact they have that vasospasm the vessels are too constricted and you can't uh, deliver that supply of uh, oxygen to the, to the tissue there. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just know it's kind of a, a different variant of angina, not managed the same way as typical, uh, normal, you know, uh, atherosclerotic kind of manifested uh, sort of angina. Anyway, so our goals here, we'd like to prevent acute coronary syndromes. That's always a good thing. That helps to help improve the quality of life. We want to uh, help to relieve their symptoms and hopefully help to prevent symptoms. So if you think back to when we talked about asthma, what was it kind of the two big uh, kind of focuses on therapy? We had the fast-acting rescue sort of medications, and then we had the long-acting controller sort of medications. Same thing for angina here. We're going to have the fast-acting ones. They're good for having acute chest pain. We have the long-acting medications that are good to hopefully prevent chest pain from occurring want to increase the exercise tolerance. So that way someone doesn't have chest pain just walking down the end of the room here, but maybe they can walk down to the elevator, get down to their car before they start to have symptoms, okay? That's the goal here, right? To increase exercise capa uh, capacity. 
So um, ways we can do this. So to decrease O2 demand, we can decrease heart rate. We can decrease contractility and hopefully decrease that wall tension. We can do that by affecting pre and after load. Okay. So what are some things that could decrease heart rate and contractility we've already talked about? Beta blockers. Great. Beta blockers are going to be first line for angina, right? What else? What kind? The calcium channel blockers. Non-dihydropyridine, right? Because, again, those are working on the, on the heart directly to decrease contractility and heart rate, right? Now, we'll see that dihydropyridines play a role here as well. But, again, how do you think those are going to affect O2 demand? Well, the dihydropyridines don't really affect contractility so much. What are they going to affect? They call vasodilation decrease. Afterload, perfect, great. So again, there's other ways we're going to find some some uh, some roles to play for these various drugs here. But again, think about their mechanisms, think how they're working. You'll see how they work for angina. Again, all this makes sense. This is all just physics, basically, uh, that we're working with here, right? Anyway, uh, hopefully all you guys like physics, right? No, nope? that's okay. We'll, we'll get through it. Anyway, but other things we can do, we can try to increase O2 supply. How do you think we can do that? Yes, we want to dilate the coronary vessels, and so we're going to see some uh, specific drugs that are going to be used to, to manage that as well. Okay, So again, um, other things we can do, these are going to be drugs that may not have any direct effect on angina, but they can help to stabilize those plaques to hopefully prevent an acute coronary syndrome. And then we would hopefully want to fix any kind of modifiable risk factors, right? So again, if we're sedentary lifestyle, their diet's really bad, or whatever else we have going on, then we'd also like to address those as well. So obviously, what's the best thing you can do for a blocked vessel? Give them the rotor rooter treatment and just clean it right out, right? That would be great. Um, not all patients may be uh, candidates for that. Sometimes they have to undergo cabbage and whatnot. Um, but we're going to focus mainly on the pharmacotherapy, right? Because you're a pharma class. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to see there we have what we call the anti-anginals. These are directly going to be affecting the actual symptoms themselves or maybe preventing the symptoms. And we have what we call the vascular protective agents. So these are going to include your antiplatelet drugs. These are going to include your statins. Remember how we talked about the pleiotropic effect of statins? They stabilize those plaques. That's another big benefit of why we like statins so much there. ACE inhibitors, these are also going to be playing a role here as well. Okay. So again, these are other drugs. So if you have someone who has angina, guess what? They probably have hypertension. They probably need to be on ACE inhibitor anyway, right? So these are things you're starting to see where, okay, well, they have to be on all these other drugs anyway, and all these are going to be working for their hypertension as well, right? Uh, well, hopefully decrease in mortality, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I say I do the same thing all the time, right? Hopefully we – I like to say, like, improvements on mortality. Right? What do you mean you want to kill your patients more? I was like, no, like, improvements, like, you're decreasing mortality, right? So, yes, that is exactly what you're trying to say. So hopefully increasing the quantity of life that the patients are having. The antianginals are going to be affecting the quality of life, you know, uh, more so than anything else, right, in addition to hopefully preventing that ECS from occurring. Okay. So looking at this, um, we're going to find that the drugs that help to decrease heart rate – contractility and that systolic wall tension are going to be our calcium channel blockers, right? We'll talk about both the roles of dihydropyridine and non-dihydropyridine. We're going to have our beta blockers. We're going to have our nitrates, okay? We haven't talked about nitrates before, but this will be a new set of drugs we haven't talked about. And then to increase coronary blood flow, we'll also see calcium channel blockers play a role here. And then we're going to have some nitrates, aspirin, and then clopidogrel. We haven't talked about a lot of the antiplatelet drugs. That'll come back up a little bit later on. So we'll talk about those in more detail here in just a second. So antianginals, the goal here is to increase their exercise capacitance. Hopefully we can uh, maybe reduce any kind of exercise-induced SC changes, right? And hopefully we don't see any kind of changes as far as, you know, um, you know uh, ischemia or infarct here. And so things we can do to decrease those frequency of symptoms, good controller medications, are going to include our beta blockers, our calcium channel blockers, and then our long-acting nitrates. We're going to find for acute treatment of angina, what's our go-to? Nitroglycerin, right? So it's a, considered a nitrate. That's going to be our quick go-to. It's like the albuterol. For treatment of asthma, right? So if you have an uh, acute asthma attack, you take albuterol. If you have an acute anginal attack, you take nitrates, right? You take nitroglycerin. So looking at this, um, again, just an idea of how you kind of grade angina. A lot of it goes down to kind of when you develop symptoms, whether it's at rest, which we call unstable angina, which is much more serious than if you were to have, say, something where, you know, I can have, you know, um, some degree of physical activity before I develop symptoms. Again, I'm not going to get into the gradation here, but just know that's how we kind of delineate and based on symptomatology typically. So Getting into uh, looking at the beta blockers here. So beta blockers, what are they going to do? They're going to decrease heart rate. They're going to decrease contractility. And hopefully they're going to decrease systolic blood pressure. So that helps out with which aspects of the wall tension? The afterload, good. And uh, they may increase LV volume a little bit, but it's not going to be the main role here. The biggest thing, though, is going to be the decrease in heart rate and contractility. Okay. Now, do they affect supply? Not really. They don't really affect anything as far as the, the coronary vessels go. Now, typically, these are going to be first line unless you have a contraindication, okay? So let's have some reason you cannot receive a beta blocker. These are going to be good for those patients. As we mentioned, when do you want to use a beta-1 selective agent? 
asthma, history of reactive airway disease, anything like that. Um, the other benefits here is these are going to be good for patients who have, say, like supraventricular arrhythmias. So they have AFib, AFib flutter. Like, these are good to help control that. Uh, they have a history of, um, you know, post-MI. Like, this is also going to be another drug they need to be on anyway because we know it reduces mortality. If they have heart failure, they have hypertension. This is why we like beta blockers for this so much because they have a lot of other reasons they may need to be on it anyway. So these are very good from that standpoint. And again, we've already covered the agents here. Um, again, they have asthma. Go with the first, uh, go with the uh, cardio one, uh, beta one selective agent you know, like metoprolol. Atenolol is great there. You know, um, you know, we'll talk about CHF later, but they have that. Then let's put them on carvedilol. Let's put them on, you know, uh, bisoprolol. We'll look at some options there a little bit later on. We'll talk about CHF. So again, beta blockers, good first line agent for control of angional symptoms. Okay, to prevent those angional symptoms from occurring. Again, when would you be contraindicated from receiving a beta blocker? Uh, well, hopefully with pregnancy, if you have angina, hopefully, hopefully that would be a, a consideration. But um, yeah, so again, if you already have low heart rate, if you already are hypotensive, you don't want to use a beta blocker, right? Because again, it's going to cause uh, worsened effects here. You have to be really careful with patients with CHF because you can cause a decompensation. Because again, they need that cardiac output. If you drop that at all, it can lead to decompensation. So be careful with that. As I mentioned, we already talked about other kind of relative contraindications like diabetes and peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, right? Again, you guys already know the side effects. We don't have to talk about them because we just went over them like yesterday. It's perfect, right? Or actually this morning we just went over them. So thing to think about. All right. Um, so don't forget about the sticky board. Put questions up there, right? I think that was helpful for some people. It's good. Uh, any questions before I continue on? All right, so keep moving here. So uh, now going back to the calcium channel blocker. So what are these going to be good for? So it depends on which ones you're talking about, right? So our non-dihydropyridines, what are those going to do for us? They're going to decrease heart rate, right? They're going to decrease contractility. They're going to decrease systolic blood pressure. These are all good things, right? They may decrease LV volume a little bit because you may see some mild, mild effects on, on preload. But again, the big things are going to be effects on the heart and on the systolic blood pressure. That's the big things here, okay? On the flip side, though, you have the dihydropyridines. What does that do to heart rate? Well, may actually increase a little bit, if anything, right? doesn't really have much effect on contractility, so you don't have to think about that too much. But the big thing here is big drops in systolic blood pressure, right? So this is good as an add-on agent. Typically, you don't use a dihydropyridine by itself for anginal symptoms. However, you may add it on to something else. That's where that is going to be playing a role here, okay? Now, um, you may also see on the supply side, maybe some mild dilation of the vessels and areas of stenosis, but it's kind of a minor effect. Maybe some relief of vasospasm. This is going to be important when we talk about that Prince metal angina. When you're dealing with that, you want to use the dihydropyridines. And I'll cover that in a slide later on, but that's kind of a, just a, a, a teaser for a little bit later on in the slide set. So you can't for Prince, because I, I actually had that question in clinical class. So you, can't, you shouldn't use non-dihydropyridines? Yeah, because their issue is not necessarily the O2 demand on the heart, right? Their issue is the vasospasm. So if I can get something that directly treats the vasospasm, then that is the best treatment for it. So that's why we'd use a, a dihydropyridine like amlodipine or something like that. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Um, now, just to break it down a little bit further, again, verapamil diltiazem, you can think about them as kind of the same same actions here, right? So, again, no big differences on their effects. Um, and, again, you can think about the dihydropyridine. These are just some example ones. These are some of the common ones you run into, like nifedipine, amlodipine, velodipine. They're all going to have uh, very similar effects here, okay? Again, um, but think about when you want to use one versus the other. Which ones might I want to add on to something else? So say, for instance, I had a patient with a beta blocker for angial symptoms. They're still having some symptoms and really not where I want them to be. What would I add on to that if I had to choose a calcium channel blocker? A dihydropyridine, right? Because what happens if I add on a non-dihydropyridine onto a beta blocker? Synergistic, way too much decrease in, in contractility, way too much decrease in heart rate. Don't want to do that. It's going to just be adding on too much. Most patients cannot handle that. Okay, so that's why I'd use, say, something like dihydropyridine is going to work more in the vasculature, uh, vasculature, right? So, again, you can use a non-dihydropyridine as first line if a patient could not receive a beta blocker, right? So maybe a diabetic patient, I don't want to use a beta blocker, and this is a good alternative, using a non-dihydropyridine like verapamil diltiazem, okay? Um, if I want to use it in combination, that's where your dihydropyridines fall into place. So if I could add on amlodipine, someone who already had it on a beta blocker. Now, would I want to mix verapamil with, say, something like a dihydropyridine? Typically, you don't do that. It would, some way, it would make some sense, but again, you're looking for more synergy by using complementary mechanisms. You don't want to necessarily attack the calcium channels from two different sides. Um, so clinically, you don't see that very frequently. I don't know if I've ever seen it. There may be some rare cases where you want to do it, but I don't see it, right? Um, and then other big places when you're going to combine it with long-acting nitrates, which we'll talk about in just a few moments here, okay? So again, big place this is going to be playing a role is for patients who cannot tolerate a beta blocker's first line. Or if you had someone who had vasospastic angina, as we'll mention, that's going to be good for a dihydropyridine to treat that, okay? 
And again, um, you see here the drug selection, non-DHP for the uh, first line, DHP when you combine with the beta blocker. And typically we like to avoid short-acting agents because again, if you think about it, if you relieve that vasospasm, right, you're decreasing that systolic blood pressure, and then all of a sudden the drug wears off very quickly, what happens? Constrict back up and you can induce more anginal symptoms, right? So long IT medications are good here, right? So that's why sometimes we use nifedipine, it's a long acting form. So you'll see like, you know, a nifedipine LA or something like that for long acting. But normally it's short acting. Hmm? But normally it's short acting. It depends on which form you get, right? So again, you're going to find um, that you can have ones that have a short half life, but if I give them as a long acting formulation, I can get kind of similar effects as if it had a long half life. You get a feel for it if you work with these patients, you know, what your mainline drugs are going to, to go with. And again, I'm not going to get so granular on a, a test to be like, you know, which one of these is short acting and you wouldn't want to use for angina. Like, I'm not going to get that granular with it. I want to say, though, that, you know, I may ask, like, why would you want to avoid a short acting calcium channel blocker for patient with angina? You'd say, okay, it could actually precipitate anginal symptoms as the drug wore off, right? That could be something I may, I may ask, right? Um, anyway, so again, contraindication is very similar to the beta blockers, right? They already have. Um, uh, bradycardia, they already have hypotension, avoid these drugs, right? Now, bradycardia, is that a problem for the dihydropyridines? No, because again, if anything, it actually increase heart rate a little bit. So that would not be contraindication. So think about how the drugs are working, what would make one drug contraindicated for one patient versus another, right? Um, now, again, which ones inhibited CYP3A4? Verapamil and Diltiazin, they both inhibited CYP3A4, so you have to think about those interactions. Because again, what do we say is one of those vascular protective drugs that we had on that list that works for, uh, that actually uh, was metabolized by CYP3A4? The statins, right? So again, if I had a patient who had anginal symptoms, they're on simvastatin, and I want to put them on, say, verapamil for a control of the anginal symptoms, all of a sudden they come in, rhabdomyolysis, that's on you, right? So you got to look up those interactions, be careful with that. Now, how about the dihydropyridines? Do they inhibit CYP3A4? They do not, right? It's just for rapid and them. Okay, so again, those are big interactions you want to think about. Yeah, so if I had another inhibitor on board, that could affect the DHPs, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yep. yep, absolutely. And again, we know the side effects here. We know the flushing is going to be a big thing with these. You're going to see a lot of GI side effects like the calcium channel blockers, think. Constipation is a big one, right? So again, again, think about patients elderly you may have constipation already. You can worsen that by using these drugs here, right? Um, and again, just educate them about the constipation aspect. You know, how, how can we treat that constipation? We haven't covered GI yet, but what are some things you can? Huh? Like stool softeners. Uh, what are some like non non farm stuff? More fiber, hydrate, right? Most people tend to be more chronically dehydrated. Um, so again, lots of water. And again, be careful if you have someone who has fluid overload, though, right? So again, it's all going to be dependent on the patient there. Anyway, so those are the calcium channel blockers. Those are the beta blockers. Now we have the nitrates here. So this is the new class of drugs. We'll spend a little bit more time on here. Now, the nitrates are going to be causing dilation of the coronary arteries. This is the big reason why we use these for acute onset of anginal symptoms, right? So if you have chest pain, take a nitrate, right? Immediately. We also have some long-acting forms that are going to be good for more long-term prevention of symptoms as well. We're going to look at those in a few minutes. They also help to relieve vasospasm, so this could also be used potentially for that Prinz metal angina. And then they have some antithrombotic, antiplatelet effects. And again, what usually precipitates an MI? A clot that's blocking off those coronary vessels, right? Good. So some antiplatelet effects can be useful here, right? And if anything, think about the heart rate. Why would the heart rate go up with the nitrate? Same reason, yeah, same reason what you see with the dihydropyridine, right? Causing vasodilation, so the reflex tachycardia is what you're going to see with that, okay? So be careful. You may see some increase in O2 demand. It's minimal, but you can, could see that. But the big thing here is it's going to drop systolic blood pressure, and it's going to be also decreasing um, uh, the venous constriction as well. So you're going to have a lot more of that fluid being uh, uh, held out in the, in the venous side of things, and that's going to decrease the preload as well, okay? So how do these work, right? So we have our nitrates, right? And again, nitroglycerin is kind of the prototypical one we're going to think about. It's going to cause an increase in production of cyclic GMP. Normally, cyclic GMP is going to cause a decrease in the amount of calcium that's within the cell. And we said, what happens when you decrease calcium in those smooth muscle cells? They relax, right? They can't bind that calcium, uh, the actin and the myosin, so they're going to relax. So you see vasodilation, so you drop some blood pressure. Well, how do we regulate that CGMP? Well, we're going to have an enzyme here called phosphodiesterase 5, PDE5. This is going to be one of those things that's going to help to break down cyclic GMP into inactive forms. Now, why do I mention this here? Because it's sildenafil, right? Sildenafil, tadalafil, and bardenafil. What do we use these for? Anyone know? Erectile, Erectile dysfunction, right? So, again. Or in children. Hmm? Or in children, yeah. So, we use it for things like pulmonary hypertension, absolutely. So, we, again, we see this in the cardiac unit. Uh, quite frequently. So we'll talk about this because, again, you think about, you know, what are the things that precipitate anginal symptoms? 
exertion, right? What's an act that you may be using sildenafil for that could cause exertion? If you're having sex, this could be something where you have onset of chest pain during intercourse, and they may be using these drugs. This is going to be really important here because what you're going to find is you cannot mix nitrates with these erectile dysfunction meds. Okay, This is a big contraindication. You have to ask the question. We'll talk about this more in detail, but again, you're going to find that you're going to find very synergistic effects here when you're mixing these two drugs together. Because basically, what this is doing is inhibiting that phosphodiesterase five. If I can't break down cyclic GMP, I'm going to have a ton of it here, and guess what it's going to cause? Big, big drops in blood pressure, right? Huge drops in blood pressure. And if I bottom out my patient, guess what they're not going to perfuse? The heart and the head. And again, it's going to worsen the ischemia. No good. Okay, so start to think about that because we're going to talk about it more in detail in a second here. So anyway, so. Um, Looking at the short-acting nitrates, these are going to be good for kind of rescue symptoms, right? So if you have an acute onset of anginal symptoms, this is what we're going to use. And so these are going to, uh, in some cases, you may try to use it to prevent effort-induced angina, so maybe they'll use it kind of prophylactically, but for the most part, you're going to be educating patients to use this at the onset of anginal symptoms, right? A couple of different options here. This is nitroglycerin. We have either like a, a, a sublingual spray, they spray underneath the tongue, or they have sublingual tablets. Now, again, why do we like sublingual? Fast absorption, bypasses first pass, don't have to worry about the GI tract, have them absorb it from there. So again, that's a good education. Don't tell them to swallow the tablet, just have them put it under the tongue, right? You have to tell them how to use it correctly, otherwise it may not work as well, okay? Now, what we used to do is we say, hey, take, go ahead and take a dose at the onset of symptoms and take it every five minutes. By the third dose, you still have chest pain, call 911. What was the problem with that? Well, we'll talk about tachyphylaxis. It's not really an issue kind of in the acute phase here. You know, the 15 minutes. Well, think about the ischemia to the heart, right? Time is tissue. If they're truly having an infarction, you want to get that patient managed right now, right? So that's why you talk a lot about like door to balloon time, right? Or time, you know, door to thrombolytic time. Um, because if they're actually having a true heart attack, like you need to manage that right now. And so the longer I'm waiting, the more damage is being done to the heart tissue. So nowadays what we're seeing is that we're delaying patients from calling 911 too quickly. So what we'll tell them now is you have chest pain, take a dose of nitroglycerin, Continue taking every five minutes. If by that first five minutes, if you still have chest pain, call 911, okay? So that way you get EMS responding sooner and hopefully you're preserving a little bit more of that heart tissue, right? Mm -hmm. So again, minutes can make it all the difference with some of these patients here, right? So anyway, that's the big thing. Um, now, just to let them know that, you know, by moving from, say, a sitting or going to a standing position, this may kind of enhance the effects. And again, these are going to be potent vasodilators. So orthostatic hypotension can be a thing to, to see with this. Um, now, think about nitroglycerin. What happens if I put three nitroglycerins together? You have trinitroglycerin, otherwise known as TNT. Yeah, TNT. TNT is very explosive, right? It's very unstable. The drug is unstable in and of itself. So that's why I tell patients, keep the drugs in the original package, right? A lot of older patients, they want to put these like in pill reminders and things like that. You need to keep them in the original package because otherwise it can degrade over time. And I also tell them, most of the time, uh, drug expiration dates are bogus, right? You know, drugs stay good for well long past the actual expiration date listed on the bottle. However, these you do want to replace, right? After three or six months or so, they need to go get a new bottle. Because the problem is, especially here in Florida, they leave it on their dashboard in the hot Florida sun all summer. The, the drug's not going to be all that effective. It, uh, I've never seen it explode, fortunately, but um, just say the drug will, will break down, right? The drug will dissipate, and so they will try a dose and say, oh, it's not working, and you call 911. Well, maybe they just didn't have an effective dose, right? Maybe the drug actually uh, was not there in the full amount that you thought it was, okay? What is it for uh, sitting or standing? So can you tell them to sit or stand? So um, usually, I mean, hopefully they're having chest pain, they're being in more of a sitting position, hopefully they can kind of rest up a little bit, but especially if you're going from, say, a sitting to a standing position, that's where you can see more of that orthostatic hypotension that can develop with that. Yeah, and definitely recommend they put it underneath the tongue, that way it's going to be able to absorb very quickly and have its effects there, okay? So that's a short-acting nitrate, so those are the two main ways you're going to see that administered. So again, uh, moving on to the long-acting nitrates, and of course there's IV nitroglycerin we can also give as well for uh, management of blood pressure. Um, again, that is uh, something you'll see once they kind of move in more to the inpatient side of things. But long-acting nitrates, these are going to be good for helping to prevent symptoms from occurring, similar to how we'd see with the beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, okay? Um, these are not used by themselves initially. These are going to be add-on therapy, right? So again, when you think about first-line therapy for anginal symptoms, for control of that, you want to think beta blockers. You want to think non-dihydropyridines. Long-acting nitrates are going to be an add-on therapy to one of those typically, right? Or maybe even a third agent, depending on, on the situation. So, um, again, if you have, say, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers not being successful on their own, this is when you add them on, potentially. So, a um, couple of different agents we have here. So, we have something, uh, isosorbide mononitrate, isosorbide dinitrate. It's pretty easy to identify because it's dinitrate right in the name, right? Um, now, notice here, these are going to be lasting for 
about 12 hours or so, right? Or in this case, you have a three to six hour duration, you dose it say three times a day. Now, we don't want to have this drug on board 24 seven. Now, why is that? You guys remember when I talked about tachyphylaxis back in the intro to farm course back in the day? Remember I can deplete those cofactors and things like that. And so what, what is tachyphylaxis when I say that? Yeah, so either like you're, you're, uh, maybe the receptors are desensitizing or you're missing a cofactor or something is going on to where the drug, it becomes ineffective. Even if I keep ramping up the dose, it doesn't continue working, right? So I can have people get tolerant to the effects of morphine, but I can keep ramping up the dose of morphine, eventually it's going to work, right? For this one, you're going to find that even if I increase the dose super high, it doesn't really have any additional effect. That's called tachyphylaxis. So we're going to talk about the nitrate-free period. You have to have a period during the day, usually about 12 hours or so, where patients are going to be nitrate-free. That gives them time to kind of build up those uh, cofactors again and kind of reestablish sensitization. So that way they can have good effects from it the next time it's on board. So when do you think patients are going to want to have that nitrate-free period? At nighttime, right? Because typically at nighttime they are less active, they're sleeping. However, what if I had a patient who was, say, a nurse that worked overnight in the ER? Well, then maybe I'd want to have that during the nighttime, right? Maybe their nitrate-free period should be during the day. Take your patient's situation into account, right? So I talk about them. Like, when do you when are you active? Are you night out? Do you stay up till four o'clock in the morning? You know, playing video games? What do you do, right? Um, you can. Be, I mean, it's very strenuous playing video games at nighttime. I can tell you this, right? Um, it just depends, right? So again, try to figure out what's your patient's situation. When's it going to be best for them to have that 12-hour off period? Um, so again, when they're more active, usually during the daytime, this is when you want the drug on board to hopefully providing those effects there to try to increase the exercise tolerance at the a time before that strenuous activity induces those anginal symptoms. So right. if they're sexually active at night, I mean, so what's, mm -hmm. what's the, how do they affect um, That depends. So, you know, so that's also that is a strenuous activity, I should say. Um, most of the time. Um, <laughs> that depends, right? So again, typically you, you'll see, you know, depending on when they, they took it, again, this, it's a 12 hour window, right? So again, if they took it at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, maybe it's going to last them through 10 o'clock at night, who knows, right? So it's one of those things where it may have worn off by the time they're in, so maybe they're more at risk as soon as that drug wears off. And that's when they may need to take that kind of quick acting nitroglycerin, uh, uh, you know, tablet. So it's hard to say, right? Um, other long-acting nitrates, we have the ointment here. So this is actually a transdermal form of nitroglycerin. So basically, it will have the nitro paste here, uh, an ointment you'll have in, the, in this tube. And then you actually have this dosing uh, paper here. We actually will uh, dose this. This is another one you actually dose in inches or in centimeters. Where do we see that last? Yeah, the eye stuff, right? So like ophthalmic gels and ointments, we saw that we were dosing that in, in distance or in length. This is the same thing here, right? So you'd actually dose it based on you know, how many inches you want to, to administer there. Can you guess the potent of the tablet? Um, you can see if you dose it correctly, yeah, you can definitely see just as a good efficacy there with the, with the pace. So it just depends on the patient, kind of what they're going to tolerate best, you know. Um, but again, you need to do a 12 hours on, 12 hours off sort of, uh, um, you know, dosing schedule there. Yes, ma'am. So this is actually like a little wax paper um, thing. The nurse or whoever's administering can actually put it onto the actual distance. They basically squeeze out um, the ointment on there, and they just slap it on the patient, basically. I'm talking about like blood Oh yeah. Uh huh. Do they have to that? No, you're just guesstimating. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of the things where it's like, man, eh, just it's like bats trace and ointment. It's like, man, eh, just kind of get some on there, right? <laughs> Most of the time, if they even get it in, it's like it's on the eyelashes or something. It's still kind of working, but yeah, it's uh, again, there's more art to to medicine than, than science in some cases. So, um, but this one, this could be important, right? So you want to make sure you're getting a consistent dose, so that way patients like doing two you know, two two inches one day, you know, an inch the other day, two you know, two and a half inches the next day. Yeah, this one you want to be a little bit more consistent with, because again, this could be playing a big role as far as like if they get hypotensive, they have postural hypotension, you know, all these sorts of things. So um, anyway, they'll, they'll spread out the calibrated paper. Then you're going to uh, put that onto uh, basically kind of spread it out over on a, you know, kind of a two, two by two inch sort of layer there. And then you keep it covered with the applicator paper. So that way um, you don't have it, you know, kind of getting spread around or getting contact with clothing and whatnot. Now, big thing to note, wipe off the previous dose beforehand, right? So that way it's, you know, you got clean skin you're dealing with. Obviously, what could be a side effect of using the, the ointment versus, say, the tablets? Yeah, skin reactions. You can see some skin irritation with this. That may not be a good uh, for some patients, right? They may have some irritation seen with that. Um, now, keep in mind, you see the same effects here, but imagine who might also be at risk for uh, getting side effects from this. They're administering it to a patient. 
like the nurse, right? So this is one of the things where you have to make sure you're wearing gloves, right? And it's actually a specific type of gloves uh, you have to make sure they're wearing because they can actually seep through um, some uh, certain type, like latex gloves. They can actually go through. There's another type they'll use uh, typically um, that will prevent that. But if you have a nurse who is like you know managing a patient who's coming in for a STEMI, and all of a sudden they're like, man, I just got this like the worst headache in my life. It's probably really back to the nitroglycerin, right? So again, they've now become a patient because they've been exposed to that drug there, right? So think about sort of uh, iatrogenic sort of a, a exposure to medications. Is there a certain area that's best for this? Not necessarily. Typically, people would just put it on the chest. Um, I don't know if it necessarily works that much better just in proximity to the heart, but that's typically where people will put it. Yep. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the tachyphylaxis, we've kind of covered this, but again, you need to have that nitrate-free period. That's where you're typically going to be having um, the lowest chances for anginal symptoms. Uh, so try to schedule it around then. Again, it's going to be highly patient-dependent, but normally it's going to be during the nighttime. Okay. So contraindications, aortic valve stenosis. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, well, this is more so on the, the atrioloid side. So again, if you're causing uh, vasodilation, typically you want that cardiac output to increase to compensate for that. But if you have a, a stenotic aortic valve, you can't really do that. So just like with the di dihydropyridines, the same uh, uh, logic kind of applies there. So you have to be careful with that. You know, obstructive cardiomyopathies is all going to be um, issues here. Now, as I mentioned, you have to be really careful with concurrent use of phosphodesterase inhibitors. Uh, so that's going to include sildenafil, tadalafil, and vardenafil. We'll talk about this more in the urology section later on. We have a whole section about erectile dysfunction. Um, but the problem here is it can lead to profound hypotension. Because again, you're increasing cyclic GMP by giving the nitrate, and you're also inhibiting the breakdown of cyclic GMP. So you're attacking it from both ends of the spectrum there. And so you're getting profound hypotension. You can actually underperfuse the heart, worsen ischemia. Okay? You have strokes in some cases there because you're underperfusing the brain. So you have to be really careful of those mix, uh, mixtures there. And again, who's probably the first person to interact with these patients when they have anginal symptoms? EMS. Probably EMS, right? So again, that's a very important question you need to ask. Hey, have you been taking you know, Viagra? Did you take anything you know, for, for impotence uh, recently? Because again, that can be playing a big role. Because typically, you know, they show up, they're going to give them some more nitrates. So you have to ask the question there. Because otherwise, they would be contraindicated. You would not want to administer that. Okay. Um, okay, so those are the big things to think about nitrates. So looking at this. And again, some of these disease states we're going to cover a little bit more detail later on. But um, think about what's going to be the first line of therapy for these patients based on their comorbidities, right? So if they have hypertension, beta blockers are a really good uh, first line agent there, right? They have, as an alternative, you could use a non dihydropyridine no problem. You know, both of those will treat hypertension. If they've had a previous MI, which we'll talk about a little bit later, beta blockers are going to be recommended, okay? If they have decreased LV function, beta blockers are going to also be recommended. We're going to find those typically patients are manifesting CHF. They probably won't uh, need to be on a beta blocker as well, as we'll mention here in just a, a little bit. Uh, they have bradycardia. Probably don't want to give them a non dihydropyridine Don't want to give them a beta blocker. Maybe a dihydropyridine is a good alternative here, right? So, again, kind of think about these things. Think about the mechanisms for why one might be preferred, why one might be avoided versus another, okay? So, again, kind of think through these. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously, let me know. But uh, a lot of these, I think, will make intuitive sense based on kind of what we've talked about already, okay? So uh, those vascular protective agents we're going to mention here, ACE inhibitors are very good because, again, while they don't really have a big effect on oxygen demand or supply necessarily, they're not going to help to relieve acute symptoms. We do know they're going to help with uh, preventing remodeling. We know they're going to help in the long run uh, to help with kind of preventing a lot of these cardiac events here. So generally, patients with cardi uh, coronary artery disease should probably be on an ACE inhibitor, right? This is going to be a good drug for, for those patients there. Especially if they have any LV dysfunction, if they're post-MI, they definitely need to be on it. Diabetes, they definitely need to be on ACE inhibitor anyway, right? As I mentioned with combo therapy, typically um, if the angina is going to be persisting with just monotherapy by itself, this is when you can add on something else. You know, you can consider adding on a beta blocker with, say, a dihydropyridine, but be careful if you ever wanted to do a beta blocker with a uh, non-dihydropyridine. That might be a bad combination. I probably would not recommend that in a lot of cases there. Um, and again, if they need a third agent to help control their angina symptoms, they probably need a bigger workup than just with uh, pharmacologic management. They probably have already seen a cardiologist anyway, so hopefully they're getting that workup to see if they need to go uh, undergo PCI or something like that. Okay, um, looking at antiplatelet drugs. We've already talked about aspirin before. How does it work as an antiplatelet? The Cox yeah, remember through the Cox pathway, remember it helps to, um, and we're going to get into more detail on this in a few seconds here, but remember that um, aspirin is an antiplatelet drug. Why do we like aspirin versus, say, the other NSAIDs as an antiplatelet? Do you remember? Because it's an irreversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenase. So for the lifetime of that platelet, I mean, every day, seven, 10 days, whatever it is, um, you're going to find that plate is going to be inhibited and in preventing that, um, the aggregation. So aspirin is a very good thing. That's why we call it a vascular protective. It helps prevent those, um, those vessels from getting clogged in the first place. So again, most patients tend to be on, need to be on aspirin. Anyone know the dose? 
81 milligrams of baby aspirin, right? But we have adult patients. Why are we treating them with baby aspirin? Because, again, we're only looking for the antiplatelet effects. We're not looking for antipyretic. We're not looking for analgesic, anti-inflammatory. We just want it for the antiplatelet effects. And 81 is all you really need, okay? Now, if they're having an acute onset of uh, chest pain, and they're coming in via EMS, like, how much are they going to get? Yeah, I usually get 325. We'll talk about Mona a little bit later on when um, we get to the ACS stuff. But again, aspirin's really good. We'll talk about clopidogrel a little bit later. It has a different mechanism, but we'll talk about that. But that can be a good alternative if the patient cannot receive aspirin. Okay. I'm sure you've already heard of clopidogrel if you covered it in your medicine course, right? Okay. So again, um, unless there's any contraindications, patients should be on aspirin. Patients should be on a beta blocker if they've had a previous MI, right? Um, ACE inhibitors, definitely if they have diabetes or LV dysfunction, should definitely be on that. They definitely should be on lipid lowering therapy, primarily with what? Statins, good. Uh, and then sublingual nitro for acute pain, uh, angel relief, right? So again, there's already multiple prescriptions these patients are going to be on. See how this kind of balloon out? Patients can be on 12, 15 medications, right? You got to be careful with these. Um, and as mentioned, if they have daily or more frequent symptoms, this is where you're going to use the prophylactic therapy. So beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, long antinitrates can be playing a role here, right? So again, they may already be on a beta blocker for the previous MI, and that kind of already is treating the, the, the angel symptoms, right? It's already uh, working as a preventative there. So again, that's why a lot of these drugs are pulling double duty, as we'll see, right? As I mentioned, the treatment of the variant angina, angina or the prince metal angina, this is where the uh, dihydropyridines play a role here. Again, the oxygen demand by the heart is not the issue. It's the vasospasm. It's the supply side. Uh, so we'll give them something like amlodipine. It's going to be very good for that. Um, but typically, you want to avoid beta blockers. It actually can worsen the symptoms, right? Because it only will decrease um, cardiac output, but doesn't necessarily do anything on the supply side of things. Okay? Yeah, dihydropyridines would be preferred here, right? Because, again, we don't want to decrease contractility in, in heart rate necessarily, right? Okay, so any questions on angina? Moving on, let's start to talk about some of our antiplatelet and anticoagulation uh, sort of drugs here, okay? So antiplatelets, right? So typically, blood needs to flow when it needs to flow, and it should clot off when it needs to clot off, right? So how do we maintain that balance? The clotting factors, things like our platelets are going to be regulated. All right, so we're going to go over those details here, because again, we don't want things to clot off prematurely, because that can lead to thrombosis. We don't want that to occur, right? So again, and keep in mind, uh, the big delineation we're going to talk about is antiplatelet drugs, and then we're going to have our anticoagulants, right? So antiplatelet, anticoagulants. They work through different mechanisms here. So have you gone through your clotting cascade? You've covered a clotting cascade. I know you have at some point, right? So this is going to be where your anticoagulants work. Antiplatelets are specifically just working with the platelets, right? A lot of times you're using both in concert with one another, because again, they provide some nice synergy there, but again, keep them in your mind separate is that what the effects are going to have here. Because again, we have different classes of drugs that are going to work on either side of things. Okay. Um, and again, anyway, so once we have a thrombus actually occur here, we also need to reestablish flow. So we're going to look at drugs that can actually do that as well. So we'll, we'll get into more detail in just a few moments here. Um, now, again, normally when you have injury to a vessel, initial response you're going to see is vasospasm. That does what? Limits bleeding, hopefully, right? So you're going to see that it's going to be mediated by things like thromboxane. Uh, but then you're going to form what we call platelet plug. Okay, so again, by having exposure of those platelets to certain things like von Willebrand's factor, etc., you're going to find that platelets are going to get activated. Now, normally, platelets have this nice kind of like kind of globular sort of shape. But what happens when they get activated? They kind of shrink in, and they have all these little kind of feet and things that are hanging off of them, right? And they're going to grab on other platelets. So you have this initial plug of platelets that occurs here that's going to help to start stop the bleeding. They're also going to find um, a bunch of other mediators and things for playing a role here. And then eventually, you're going to have activation of the clotting cascade. Now, the eventual outcome of the clotting cascade is what product? Fibrin, right? Fibrin is going to be this kind of the thing about Spider-Man's web, kind of holding everything together. So you have the initial platelet plug, and then you have the fibrin web that's going to kind of hold it all into place. And then now you have a stable clot, okay? That's good, but you don't want to keep that there forever. So then how do you get rid of it? This is well, so you're going to have things like TPA to activate conversion of plasminogen over into plasmin, and plasmin will break down that fibrin, Okay. So again, we're going to cover all details of this and all the different drugs are going to be affecting this, right? So getting into it. So normally the endothelial surface uh, has is very smooth. It has this nice layer that's going to prevent it from activating platelets, you know, inappropriately. But it's when you have that actual damage being done that it releases a lot of those factors or it will expose a lot of those factors like collagen, von Willebrand's factor, et cetera. And then also you have this enzyme called antithrombin-3. This is actually a very important enzyme that will inactivate a lot of clotting factors that are normally circulating around the bloodstream, okay? Because again... You don't want to have the clotting factors activating inappropriately because otherwise you'll have a clot. You don't want that. Um, heparin also plays a big role here as well. Heparin we know is a drug, but we produce our own heparin as well. And that works along with antithrombin-3 to inactivate a lot of these clotting factors. Okay. 
So looking at things like, you know, process cycling, these tend to inhibit platelet activation. So you can see why blocking cycle oxygenase can help to help along with this, right? So again, by, by preventing uh, production of things like thromboxane, you can help to prevent platelet activation here. So where things like, you know, NSAIDs and aspirin work in, in this uh, way. Um, plasmin, we know is going to be really important for digesting that fibrin and kind of uh, uh, disintegrating that, that clot that happens there. Um, and just know there's a lot of other factors are playing a role here, but we're going to cover the main ones that the drugs are going to be interacting with. And here's kind of a picture of what it would look like. Again, you see the, the red blood cells kind of getting held up in here. Here's a lot of that fibrin. It's going to kind of be holding it all together in that nice stable clot. Just an example, looking at the platelet adhesion and activation. Normally, you'd see here in a nice, smooth sort of endothelial lining. The platelets are resting. They're not. They're in this nice kind of globular shape. They're not really doing anything. When they get exposure to that collagen and the von Willebrand's factor, you see how it's going to start to uncover active sites. This is where you kind of see a shrink in, and then we have exposure of things like the 2B3A receptors. These are going to be really important because they're going to start to then bind together multiple platelets there, and that's where you see this recruitment happening. This is actually an example of a positive feedback loop where it kind of feeds in on itself to try to activate a lot of these things all, uh, uh, to a greater degree, and then that's where you see the clot actually form. So this is really important. We're going to find many drugs are working on different sites here on the platelet. So uh, again, when you see that collagen is being exposed, that's when you're going to have binding of that von Willebrand factor, and then you're also going to find that you have release of what we call thromboxane A2 and then ADP. ADP is what? Adenosine diphosphate, right? So that's going to be important when we talk about some of our drugs that are going to be affecting this, okay? Um, when you have ADP and thromboxin A2, this causes that conformational shape that will expose that 2B3A, and this is going to be the thing that links those multiple platelets together. Fibrin is actually the thing that is a crosslink, but the receptors there are what's important there. Again, I mention this because this is where some of our drugs are going to be working, the block 2B3A. So once that crosslinking occurs here, then you're going to start to have thrombin getting involved, and thrombin is also known as what clotting factor? Two, right? Two A, right? Uh, thrombin is two A, and again, that's kind of the end result almost. Uh, that's what the last thing is before you convert fibrinogen over into fibrin, right? So the last clotting factor there. Um, and you're going to start to see that's going to also stimulate platelet activation. So you can see how the anticoagulant side versus antiplatelet side interact with one another, right? So again, it's a very concerted sort of effort here. And then we have the ADP receptors. We're going to activate some of these other ones, which will then activate other uh, platelets. Okay? Again, it's a positive feedback loop. Again, I mentioned this one because again, this is where some of our drugs are working. So you can see on this platelet here, where the different um, uh, you know different mediators are going to be working through to eventually cause this crosslinking to happen here, and we'll see where some of our drugs are going to be working in, right? So we're going to find some drugs are going to work on the ADP receptor. We're going to find that some drugs will prevent production of thromboxane, where aspirin fits in, right? This is how we prevent that. Uh, uh, this is where cyclooxygenase uh, blocking plays a role here. We're going to find that. This is where our 2B3A receptor antagonists are going to be playing a role. So you probably covered all these drugs already in your medicine course. We'll go over more detail on them uh, right here. Okay. So um, looking at what we normally have to inhibit platelet activation, this is where things like prostacyclin or PGI2 can be playing a role. Um, normally, the collagen is not normally exposed, so that helps to prevent platelets from being activated. Uh, and, you know, we don't have a lot of thrombin floating around. And those platelets normally, when they're in that normal resting state, they don't show those 2B3A receptors. It's only when you activate them, they kind of shrink in, is when they're going to start to expose those receptors. And that's when you see that cross-linking occur there. Okay, so normally, this is a normal resting state. Platelets remain inactivated. But once we have those mediators start to be uh, expressed, this is when you're going to start to see the activation occur. So let's go over the individual classes of drugs we're going to see here um, uh, that work as antiplatelet drugs. So aspirin is the first one. Again, this is the most common one your patients are going to be on, right? Because typically this is a good uh, vascular protective sort of drug. Most patients should be on if they have any kind of uh, you know, coronary artery disease. Now, as I mentioned, this is irreversible. I mean, once it binds that platelet, it's going to be uh, working to block that cyclooxygenase for the lifetime of that platelet, again, 7 to 10 days or so. Now, um, could a normal inset like ibuprofen work as an antiplatelet? Yeah, only for the time that the drug is around, right? So I can give ibuprofen around the clock, but then there's a lot of other side effects with it. I don't want to do that, right? So aspirin is the only real one, the only inset we really use as an antiplatelet drug because it's the only one that's irreversible. So, and again, by increasing that, uh, by decreasing the production of thromboxane A2, you lead to one less mediator that can activate those platelets, okay? And you only need 81 milligrams every day to keep the, the circulating supply of platelets inactivated, right, for the most part, which is good. And again, it's not a full inactivation of the platelets because, again, you still need some clotting to occur, but again, it's going to be enough to where you can hopefully prevent those coronary events from occurring there. We know we have the studies to show us that, yes, you do have a reduction in those coronary events when you have patients on aspirin, right? This is one of the oldest drugs we have. People have been on for a long time. We do know that it works, right, based on the, the literature. 
Now, actually, if you have too high of a dose, so you actually end up uh, limiting some of that prostacycline activity. And again, we know that's actually an antiplatelet in and of itself, so that's why you want to limit that dose there. Only use the 81 milligrams. Okay. Again, looking at this, you see the we've covered this before, but again, when you have that uh, arachidonic acid being formed here, you're going to find that by blocking cyclooxygenase, you prevent kind of production of all of these. But the big one we're focusing on is thromboxin A2. That's a big one that's playing a role as far as um, preventing platelet activation by decreasing amounts of t uh, thromboxin A2, right? Okay, so as I mentioned, aspirin, non-selective uh, uh, in inhibitor of cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Um, the big one we're going to be playing a role here is going to be um, more COX-1, right? So COX-1 is a big one we're thinking about. Um, as far as uh, being the constitutive one, that's one that helps with things like, you know, prostaglandin formation for the GI tract and whatnot. COX-2, you think about it being the inducible one that is, you know, you have inflammation or something like that gets expressed here. Um, here, we're going to find that COX-2 is the main thing that also produces that prostacycline. Um, so this one, we're not necessarily too worried about. Um, but uh, COX-1 is going to be the one that helps with the thromboxane more so. Okay. Um, when we talk about more about NSAIDs later on, like in the pain management section, we'll talk about COX-2 inhibitors uh, and how those actually led to increase cardiac events, so don't worry about that too much here, but just know COX-1 is the main thing we were focusing on here for antiplatelet effects. So as I mentioned, um, you know, you could use other NSAIDs, but they're not going to be sticking around for very long. So this is why we like aspirin. It's irreversible, last 7 to 10 days or so for the lifetime of that platelet. Now what side effects do we expect to see from aspirin? A lot of GI stuff, right? So again, if you're decreasing, and again, we're using baby doses, so you're unlikely to see things like peptic ulcer disease develop from use of this aspirin, but if you're using it in combination with other NSAIDs, this is where you can see some additional effects from this, right? So you can see some dyspepsia, some GERD, peptic ulcer disease, and again, bleeding is going to be the other big risk, right? Because again, I'm inhibiting platelets, so that means, stands to reason, bleeding is going to be more of a risk, okay? It's a slight risk, not as big as some other drugs, but it's still a risk, right? Yeah, because again, that, that gastric barrier is going to be inhibited because normally, we'll cover this in GI later on, but normally that is uh, produced when you have those uh, prostaglandins around. Yep. So um, there's another antiplatelet drug uh, called dipyridamol that also probably works through this uh, similar mechanism. This one is not used frequently from a cardiovascular standpoint, but more so from a, um, uh, more from stroke. So oftentimes you'll see this um, being used uh, in combination with aspirin uh, to help prevent things like TIAs or transient ischemic attacks and stroke. Not used frequently from a patient with a coronary artery disease, but I just kind of mentioned it here um, uh, just for kind of completeness sake. But this one not used frequently uh, for cardio protection in patients with coronary artery disease. It's called dipyridamol. Um, the, the next group I want to talk about though is the ADP receptor blockers. These are the ones that use a lot of use for a lot of these patients. And this is especially good for patients who cannot take aspirin, right? So they have an aspirin allergy, they cannot receive it for whatever reason. This is another good group to go with. This is also a, a group of drugs. If you're going to the cath lab, you're going to need a PCI, you're also probably going to get a big loading dose of one of these ADP receptor antagonists, right? And so basically by blocking uh, ADP from interacting with either the P2Y1 or the P2Y12 receptors, you're going to be able to directly inhibit the aggregation of the platelets, okay? They're going to have a direct inhibition of fibrinogen from binding those 2B3A receptors, so you can't have that cross-linking form, and it'll also interfere with that binding with von Willebrand factor. So several mechanisms here, but just know that by blocking ADP, you're preventing platelet aggregation. That's the, the big takeaway from that. So the three drugs we have here, um, actually the three ones we're mainly talking about, there's four drugs listed here. Ticlopidine doesn't get really used anymore. It was the first one we had, but there's some issues with it uh, as far as causing uh, certain rare side effects, which I'll mention in a second. But the three big ones we use is clopidogrel. And then that one was uh, kind of the big blockbuster one for a while. And then we had two other ones that are kind of being uh, used more frequently nowadays, but that's called ticagrelor or brilinta. And then we have prasugrel or effiant. Okay, and again, a lot of these anticoagulants are not going to have a very, or antiplatelet drugs don't have a good naming convention to them, so I, I apologize. You know, like ACE inhibitors, they're easy. Beta blockers, they're easy. Um, these guys may not follow that same um, nomenclature. But anyway, the clopidogrel, ticagrelor, and uh, prasugrel. So both of those are going to have very good effects on, on uh, inhibiting platelets. But if you look at this, you know, we see a delayed effect, you know, maximal effect of 8 to 11 days. If I have a patient with an acute coronary event, Probably want something that's going to kick in like right now, right? So how do I get around that? How do I get this to steady state faster? You want to give a loading dose, absolutely. So oftentimes you're going to see patients get a big loading dose of the drug before going to the cath lab, so that way they're already at steady state and hopefully already interacting with the platelets, right? Because again, with something like aspirin, you want that on board all the time because you want that to prevent production of thromboxin A2. With this one, you're actually blocking ADP from interacting with those receptors. So you want to have that. Uh, that's actually working you know, in a concentration-dependent effect. So you want to get that concentration up to kick in and block those platelets from aggregating. Okay. 
Again, you see some synergism with aspirin, so sometimes you'll see the combination being used if they're especially at high risk for having a clotting event or used as monotherapy if a patient cannot receive aspirin for whatever reason there. And again, very, uh, very often patients are going to go on this uh, part of angioplasty. Uh, they have previous MI, peripheral artery disease. All these are going to be really good options uh, to help kind of keep those platelets from aggregating together. Um, I would have to look. I'm not sure off the top of my head. There's a lot of off-label uses for a lot of the drugs we're talking about. Yeah, just for at least for like the plasma. Hmm. That's the main indication for it is when you're using after stent placement is to prevent, especially if you have like either a bare metal or drug eluting stent. Like that's the the main role to play with that. Okay, but it's not off label. Um, not as far as I know. I think it's probably one of the main indications for it. Okay. Yeah. So it was okay. Yeah. You can come ask me later. Now, as I mentioned, teclopidine doesn't you get used very frequently. One of the big problems with it was the fact that it causes um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP. It was very rare, but once it occurred, um, it can be very uh, uh, problematic, right? So again, uh, if you're causing you know uh, you know potential mortality of 18 to 57 percent, not great. So rare. But it was not rare enough to where we actually don't really use this drug anymore, right? So again, this is kind of the first one, but not really done too frequently. However, we certainly use a lot of it's clopidogrel or Plavix. And you don't have to memorize if it's a pro drug or not. Just kind of use, uh, just kind of mentioning this from uh, that standpoint. But again, how do you think it's given if it's a pro drug? So it's actually given orally. So all these agents here, the uh, ADP receptor antagonists, are oral agents. Uh, again, they have to go through the liver. They're going to get broken down into the active form, and then they kind of kick in with their effects there. As I mentioned, they need a loading dose. So again, uh, especially if they're going to the cath lab, hit them with a loading dose up front, and that gets them to steady state, and then they have full antiplatelet effects right, at, right there. Now, again, notice here the TTP is still a risk, but it's very, very low, 0.00035%. I probably take those chances. It sounds pretty pretty low risk for to me. Um, but again, what do you think the big uh, uh, side effects are going to be? The biggest one with these drugs, bleeding, bleeding and bruising, right? So always think about that as being the main side effects with the majority of these drugs here. Um, the other big ones uh, we have is prostaglandin or epinephrine. These are kind of the newer ones, and I think these have even stronger antiplatelet effects. So again, bleeding risk is going to be higher. But they also probably are a little bit more effective from an uh, antiplatelet standpoint in, in preventing, say, reocclusion of, say, a, a vessel after stent placement or, or what have you. Um, so, you know, one of the, the PAs I work with it, um, mainly works in cardiology, and he said, yeah, we're definitely using a lot more prasugrel, definitely a lot more uh, ticagrelor, mainly because it is much more effective as an antiplatelet. We take the bleeding risk. We understand that it's there, um, but we just know that this tends to be more effective, so the risk benefits kind of work out in our favor there. So that's what they're starting to see. Anyway, um, again, side effects here, you may see some hypertension associated with this. Again, a, not a clear mechanism for why that occurs, but just something to note. Uh, again, bleeding risk is a big thing. You have that um, This one uh, itself is not a pro drug, but actually has an active metabolite. So once it gets broken down by the liver, there's still an active um, component of it that's going to be still working um, in addition to the, the actual parent drug itself. But again, still need a loading dose. And again, still recommended over clopidogrel in some cases, mainly due to increased anti platelet effects there, right? Now, again, other things you may see, uh, increased uric acid. So who might that be bad in? Gout, gout patients, right? So again, one thing you may think, okay, well, they have a history of gout. Maybe I'll give them prasugrel over ticagrelor. That's something you may think about. Okay, so those are the ADP receptor antagonists. Up next, we have our glycoprotein 2B, 3A blockers, right? So remember, those are the receptors that are actually your binding to fibrinogen and link the two platelets together, okay? So if I can block those, I can have pretty good ability to block those uh, platelets from binding together. So most of these are going to be IV only agents. These are going to be used primarily um, for patients who are undergoing PCI or heading to the cath lab or, or kind of the post-operative period. Um, these are not going to be drugs that patients are going to go home on, right? The ADP receptor blockers, aspirin, absolutely. Those are going to be kind of long-term chronic management drugs. Uh, these are going to be used in the hospital, okay? So first one we have here is epsiximab. What do you notice about that drug name? It's a MAB. It's a monoclonal antibody. What do you worry about? From side effect, anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis right? So, so again, you want to think uh, with the monoclonal antibodies, you only want to think infection as being a big risk if it is an actual uh, immunosuppressant. That's a lot of them, especially for like rheumato rheumatologic conditions, things like that. Not the case here, right? So, this is specifically just targeting that 2B3A receptor. So, by binding to that, fibrinogen can't bind to it, or fibrin can't bind to it. Don't have the crosslink here. But anaphylaxis is always going to be a risk, especially with repeat administrations, right? So, if someone comes in for the first heart attack, gets abscissimab. Comes the second time, maybe they'll have a reaction to it that time, right? Uh, so you have to be careful with that. And again, bleeding always going to be a big risk. And again, typically patients who are going into uh, for angioplasty, they're getting aspirin, maybe getting heparin along uh, with that. We'll talk about heparin later on. Um, 
but again, uh, typically for short sort of durations here, maybe 18, 24 hours, and uh, then it'll be stopped, right? And it'll kind of be managed on something like an ADP receptor antagonist. And again, it's a monoclonal antibody, so it's pretty expensive. So that's always one thing to consider as well. That's why I don't like to use it for long-term use. Another one here, this is aptifibatide. Now this one is uh, a non-protein-based 2B3 antagonist, right? So as opposed to abciximab, this one you don't have to worry about uh, immunogenicity nearly as much because, again, it's not a protein. It's a lot smaller molecule there. And again, similar indications. Again, you're going to give it via continuous IV infusion, typically for, you know, a few days uh, while the patient is undergoing angioplasty and then kind of in the post-operative period to make sure they don't clot off uh, those, those vessels, right? And again, bleeding is going to be a big risk, as always. And then you have tyrofibrin or agrostat. Um, again, non-protein based, so again, less risk of immunogenicity. Bleeding is still going to be a problem with this. Again, typically given in conjunction with an anticoagulant, usually heparin or something like that, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so we have five minutes left. I know it's quick, but I'm going to say the test material will end right here. Okay? I mean, that's, I can't really make you guys read the rest of this and expect to, to, to test you on it by next week, right? Um, so test material is going to end there, uh, up through anticoagulants, so the end of the platelet stuff. So what does that mean for the test? We have opto, yeah. we have ENT, palm, and then cardio up till now. It's a lot of stuff, I won't lie, but I'm going to try to make the test. I'm going to go through and revise it, and that way it will be pretty equally weighted between all the things, right? As much as I can, right? within some reason. There's some margin for error there. Um, but yeah, but I think it'll be a good test. I think it'll be covering kind of a wide range of things, but again, a lot of these things are going to be pulling double duty, right? Things you know about clonidine. We talked about those in ENT. We talked about those in opto, right? We talked about, um, you know, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as a diuretic. We also talked about in glaucoma. So you're starting to see a lot of bleed over these drugs here, uh, you're using it for different indications, right? So again, think back about those associations. Think, okay, you know, and again, I was thinking about kind of like a flashcard sort of mentality, like just use small chunks of information. Try to link back the drug to the uh, class, right? And then once you get that association down, link the class back to the mechanism. Link the class back to the side effects. Things like that, right? You want these quick associations in your mind because, again, most of my test questions are going to be a case or something, right? Or maybe a small vignette or a small, you know, what is this mechanism of action? And you're going to get five drug names, right? So you got to make that connection. You have to be able to say, okay, abciximab, what is that? Okay, I know abciximab. Antiplatelet. Okay, well, what kind of antiplatelet is it? Okay, it's a 2B3 receptor antagonist. Okay, what do I know about that? So make those quick associations. It's going to really help you out when you're during, during your test time, okay? Now, again, let me look at the um, sticky board, see if there's any questions on there real quick, because we have a few minutes left. Any questions I can answer? Or stop the recording. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you'll find that nitroglycerin will decrease preload and afterload, because it's going to kind of have a balanced effect on both the arteries and also on the, the veins as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's more of an issue of by decreasing um, afterload. The problem is, is that the heart's going to want to compensate by increasing cardiac output. But if the aortic uh, valve is stenotic and you can't really get a good enough flow through there, then perfusion goes down, right? So that's kind of the, the concern with that for sure. Yes, ma'am. That's not the recorded stuff because I'm like recording through PowerPoint, so that's not on there. But I'm going to, uh, I applied sticky notes. Like if you go back there from the stuff we did yesterday, I put a little sticky note on there so that way I answer everything. So I'll make sure you at least can go back to it and see, see the answer that I gave. It should be the same as what I talk about, basically. Anything else? All right, so let me go ahead and check this.